So we have this amazing game called the story engine, and that's going to help us generate an idea. We're going to use your tools to develop the idea into a movie. Okay. We'll start by drawing a card. There's different cards. The first one is the agent card. Presumably that's the protagonist. So we have a, an automaton, a machine, a puppet, and a servant. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. What of the four, which one do you think would be the best to build a story around? Well, an automaton is certainly timely, and it is a machine, and it can be a puppet in certain ways, and it can be certainly a servant, so it, en it encompasses a lot of those elements, and yet is still open-ended and very much of today. Which of the four do you think would actually make the least interesting story? I don't know, because there's really infinite variables in each one. So whereas one might think a puppet or a servant would naturally appear less interesting, there's so much potential nuance and a servant often has much more capability and sort of behind the scenes facility and power than they might appear at first. Puppets have been used in varying ways where they can be brilliant and unexpected and unpredictable or treacherous and, you know, there's a, a really full spectrum potential in that too. A machine sounds more inert because a coffee grinder is a machine. So that might be the least, the least, my brain is not exploding with possibilities when I look at machine, whereas with each of the other ones, it just starts going, chick, 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 chick. my brain is just going, yeah, 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 lots, lots this right direction, just sort of all over the place of, of a, very full spectrum of possibilities for each one. Okay, I mean, so we have a, a servant, a puppet, and do you have a, a, a choice of one? I mean, you could be a, an inanimate object, or it could be a political puppet. It could be a servant uh, who works in a wealthy person's home, or it could be a, a civil servant. It could be different types of you know, we, we can choose from many different ways, but... Well, I, the automaton is the one that I think grabs me the most because it is timely and it is a kind of a puppet and is a kind of a servant, so it en encompasses, though, and it is a machine, it encompasses all of them in a rather, rather universal way. And yet with the onset of AI and Elon Musk's automaton and robots, you know, and just the general fear of robots, and the astonishing potential inherent in them, it's a rich arena that is very open-ended and kind of very chemically active in my brain before I even start poking it. Okay, so it sounds like that will be our protagonist then. The automaton. Okay. okay, now the next step would be to draw an engine card. All right, so we have wants to stop the theft of, wants to steal, or steal from. Okay. Interesting. Which scenario do you like the best? Steal is, for me, more open-ended because to stop the theft of feels more um, like a normal daily function, like a good servant would naturally be trying to stop the theft of something. And so to steal from, there, there's, you know, it's a, it's a less predictable type of automaton, the reasoning of why this automaton is trying to steal something, all the mechanics of that, all the, 
what's the word for it? Uh, the pre-programming that might have a have a type of prohibitive effect on the automaton so that the automaton's like going against internal commands or something to achieve that. You know, there, there's just, it's, feels a little more dynamic. Okay. And so open-ended. If you had to play the other scenario, how, how do you think you would weave that in with this automaton? Well, it's, there's a full spectrum, full spectrum of possibilities in terms of preventing the theft of what? You know, so it could be preventing the theft of a nuclear weapon that could end the world or, you know, blow up the eastern seaboard of America or something. Or it could be, you know, to prevent the theft of an important artifact, something of personal value. So it's like on the other end of the spectrum. And then there's everything in between of the theft of something that will severely disrupt an ongoing successful operation or the theft of something with tremendous emotional power that can really disrupt something. And it's really a, a, just a matter of like what you set the dial to, the intensity, the stakes is going to motivate the way in which this automaton works to prevent the theft. Excellent. So it could be riveting from beginning to end because the whole fate of the world hangs on it, or it could be intensely personal and it's, you know, making sure this kid's doll doesn't get taken because that's the end of the universe for that particular kid. So you just find the context and then find a way to give it magnitude, make it matter to the audience. And some of them are naturally more nail biting than others. And what if we had to choose both? What if we incorporated both scenarios? Well, that's a nice complication because it's like a crooked cop where you're, I'm here guarding the, the whatever. And while I'm doing that, I'm busy working the, yeah, working the back doors to steal something much bigger in the museum that I'm now guarding or something. There's all those um, kind of tunnels under tunnels and how do you disguise what you're up to? And, you know, is the theft from good intention or evil intention? You can be stealing something that unless you steal it, there will be a lot of trouble. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay. Okay. So now we have the anchor card. And if you would do a C on or please right. of choosing anchor card. Love how this is going. Excited to see how it turns out. All right. So we have a hospital, a contagion, a medicine, a death. Hmm. Which one of these would make the most sense in the story. A contagion is timely with COVID, but people might kind of have COVID fatigue, <laughs> uh, kind of sick of hearing about it. But generally you don't write Many people suggest not writing about topical events because quite soon they're yesterday's news. And whereas right now you could go, oh, this will, you can amplify this into something, but people may be so sick of it or not care about it six months from now. So the topical, the topicality of it sets off an alarm bell in my brain because I have kind of been trained for that. You know, go for something that's still universal a thousand years from now rather than it's forgotten about in six weeks. A medicine is interesting because that can really be world changing. Uh, and 
not only that, but, but it's the, um, there's a huge amount of money in that field. Uh, they used that well in the Harrison Ford movie, The Fugitive, where the Provasic was a medicine whose uh, lab tests were falsified so they could make big money on it. A death. A death is certainly interesting. You know, there can be high stakes there or there can be no stakes there. Like, why does nobody care that this person died? How come, like, it doesn't bleep the radar at all? Or it can be, the death can be world changing and it can be an impending death, a sudden death, a death that happened 40 years ago, a death that happened last night, a death that's been threatened. So there's, there's, broad flexibility in each one of these things like and I talk to my students about this that as we're building a script I'm always talking about how you want to be make tentative decisions and be plastic as a habit of mind so that everything everything stays fluid as long as possible because then you're not just go okay it's got to be this it's much better to be, well, it's kind of that. And then as you work with it more, you, you refine it a little bit more and you're constantly grooming it and shaping it how you want. So when I look at something like this, I don't just see one thing. I see like five or six different possibilities all clustered together as variables. And I can really, I'm trained for that. It's like a juggler. You can just, a, a skilled juggler can be like watching the news and they don't miss a ball. So like I can, I'm good at holding four or five possibilities in solution as, you know, options. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we're... And a hospital was the fourth one. Ah, okay. Yeah. So no on contagion, possibly the death. Death is interesting. Medicine is extremely interesting. Hospital is interesting. It's a whole universe unto itself. Uh, I come from a family of doctors. I grew up around hospitals. Um, and hospitals, you know, a lot of people die in hospitals so they can get a bad rep, but a lot of people get saved there. A lot of people get born there. So even though it's easy to associate them with failure and loss, there's also a huge element of regeneration and the gift of life. And, you know, all of a sudden you're going to live 50 more years when you might have died that afternoon, that kind of thing. It doesn't fascinate me as much as a medicine, for instance. <clears throat> a hospital is an interesting setting and has a lot of possibilities, but it's finite in a certain way. Medicine, I think a medicine is the most interesting and a death is the second most interesting. Okay. But a death is cool because it really is, it brings in the whole, uh, the, the element of like a murder mystery or that kind of thing. It, it like opens another whole hallway full of doors as possibilities. Okay, great. So now what we'll do is inject conflict. Okay. And so we will uh, draw a conflict card. All right. All right, we have two here. But the innocent will suffer, but it means giving up their dream. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Do automatons dream of electric sheep? <laughs> And when Philip K. Dick wrote, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I don't know, maybe 1968, I don't remember the date, but it was not current AI capabilities, even though he's a science fiction writer and he's seeing into that. But we're, these things are actually real now. So the science fiction authors are kind of like uh, working with what we have now and then projecting into the future from that. And so the idea that an Android 
might have to give up its dream. That's really interesting. And they just said they think they, they, the spider's dream that's been on the internet lately. I know, I mean, it seems like our dog dreams when he's like, he's running and barking and things. And so that's really interesting, but the innocent will suffer. Yeah, that's interesting too. And that also speaks to the, the programming. It's not the right word. The laws of robotics which goes back to Isaac Asimov. Um, I don't remember them verbatim, but you'll, you will never harm a human being or you will never allow a harm human being to be harmed by your inaction. I don't remember the other ones. But they, one of the things that I use in my class constantly in terms of working with dilemma and illustrating someone trapped in a dilemma is Robbie the Robot from uh, the movie Forbidden Planet, 1956 or something like that, which has Leslie Adams in it, the comedian, and he's playing a serious space investigator, a uh, spaceman. And they're going to a shipwrecked. It's people who've been shipwrecked on a planet. There's only two survivors, Morbius and his daughter. Um, and Morbius found some alien technology inside the planet and using that technology built Robbie the robot, who's extremely sophisticated robot, and he's demonstrating Robbie to Commander Adams, the Leslie Nielsen character. And he has Robbie, he, he has Commander Adams give Robbie the ray gun. He orders Robbie to shoot a tree outside. He does so. And then he orders Robbie to point the gun at Commander Adams, who's starting to get pretty nervous. And then he orders Robbie to fire. And Robbie starts short circuiting. He's like, eh, eh, and you can see the sheets of electricity going up through him. And he's like kind of having a meltdown. And Morbius says, Robbie is caught in a dilemma. He's been programmed on one hand to never disobey my orders, but he's also been programmed to, to never harm a human being. So he says, if I leave him like this, he'll just melt down. His literally his core will melt. Um, because his computer cannot send a command in either direction. So he releases him from the command. And it's such a great illustration of someone trapped in a dilemma, because if you have two equally unacceptable alternatives, and, and a really obvious one would be like a Sophie's Choice type, you know, sacrifice one kid or the other. She's she, like, she doesn't have a gun, but she's like, she can't, her brain can't send a command in either direction. And you want that, even though Sophie's, Sophie's dilemma is not a dilemma the way I teach it, where it encompasses a full proportion of the script. It's more just a story we are told in the middle of that movie that explains why she's so upset. That illustration of the, of the short-circuiting robot is the kind of thing you want when you create a dilemma and the innocent will suffer, that could trigger one of the robotic laws that the robot not like can't allow people to suffer because that's an unrealistic command because there's forms of suffering all over the place constantly. The robot couldn't move. If it could never allow suffering, it would be swept up in every single thing that came by him. But there's a certain degree of suffering that begins to perhaps approach death, which might trigger or activate some of the prohibitions that are built into this robot, if that makes sense. Right. I think Ursula K. Le Guin has a similar thing about suffering. We are something omelas. Hmm. But if we knew that everything would be okay if one child though had to suffer and no one would say anything about it. Yeah. But there's there's some story that she wrote that was Right. And there's a lot of moral dilemmas like that. You know, if you can save this train, there's fifty people on it, but that means thirty people on this train will die. There's all those types of things. Um which I thought would be useful in terms of working with dilemma as a writer. They're somewhat useful, but they're so specialized that it's kind of like one, one aspect of studying dilemma, which hasn't been as 
useful as I thought it would be. And so I, I know of it, but I don't mine it a lot. Let's try to add some details and we'll um, add an aspect card, which is the last card. Okay. So we have glorious, treacherous, wish granting, and cloying. Cloying means clingy or it's like unpleasant. I don't remember what exactly what that word means. Easy to look it up. I've heard it used perhaps in the sense of smell where something smells dead mm. or something, but I don't think that's a right. Let me just look so, it so up. We, yeah, let's look it up so we have the right have no idea. So the definition of cloying is disgusting or distasteful by reason of excess, mm. like cloying sweetness, excessively sweet or sentimental, a cloying romantic comedy. Her coyness grows cloying after a while. Interesting. Okay, so it's, yeah, just like too much. Okay. Okay, interesting. So. Glorious, treacherous, wish granting. Those are the two that, well, glorious and treacherous are interesting. Because as treacherous as we saw Adolf Hitler, he saw what he was doing as glorious, like he was saving the world. So the context and the point of view with which you look at these things, like this automaton could be treacherous and yet feel like it's doing the world a huge service. And it might be monstrous, but the robot may be programmed in such a way that it can't see that what it's doing is evil or wrong or ethically questionable or that kind of thing. So, so those are both very interesting. And then wish granting is fascinating. And it's interesting in part because of where quantum physics is going these days and an automaton's ability to um, manufacture, like Robbie the robot could like, Morbius would give him a sample of lead and he'd say, make us 600 pounds of lead or 600 tons of lead, and he just manufactures it inside his body. One of, the, one of um, Commander Adams' crewmen gives the robot a sample of whiskey, and the robot says, yeah, I, yes, I can manufacture this for you. Would 60 gallons be sufficient? And the, the guy's like, oh, yeah, that would be great. And that's a, a bit of an old school example, but if a if an automaton is tapped into some sort of manufacturing capability, 3D printers, even the ability to gene splice and manufacture highly specific things to order, it opens up a kind of a HAL in 2001 type thing and obviously a genie type thing, but the capacity to manifest something that was only an idea through like state-of-the-art science and enhanced capacity and access to a, like if, it, if this robot was made by a massive like manufacturing facility, it might have access to all of that equipment, even if it's stolen access. And like, yes, I could make that happen. So it's very open-ended in that way and suggestive. <clears throat> but the one that jumps right out at me is treacherous. That like grabs me by the throat. And wish granting is like, there's a lot of fun possibilities in that. It's very open-ended. 
And obviously in any story that has wish granting in it always has the caveat of, you know, be careful what you wished for, like you wanted it so badly and now you have to deal with it. But that's also, I get tired of that form of wish fulfillment stories. And it's also a kind of don't you dare think big type of thing that society does to people. You think big, you're going to get it, which just is like crushing people down. You're worthless. You're no good. And I don't like that. And so I like to go the opposite way of like, you know, dare to think big, explode the boundaries. Don't let them tell you you're not allowed to be great or be dynamic or, you know, not just think outside the envelope, but disintegrate the envelope. So it's interesting and it really could, these all, except for cloying, which feels outside the context in a certain way of these things, but also while I'm not a stranger to the word, it's not part of my normal lexicon. It's not a word that just comes to mind. And I think I've read it in novels where, you know, soldiers are marching through a city and there's dead bodies everywhere and they're saying the cloying smell, foulness filled their nostrils or something like that, like overly sweet and weird. And so it, the, the few contexts that I have for cloying don't jump out at me at all like these other three. I would say treacherous, treacherous and wish granting are the ones that jump out at me the most. Okay. Do you feel we have enough of the cards pulled uh, to make a story? Or would you like to pull an extra card um, to build more of the story around? Do you feel like you have enough here? If you were to Yeah, I mean, there's enough here to build a story. We're absolutely building from scratch because these are just raw elements. And, you know, you could build a, a wacko comedy or you could build a brutal thriller or anything in between. So it's very open ended. You know, there's a there's a direction because these things infer certain possibilities and trigger possibilities in my brain. Um, so part of me thinks, well, another card would be interesting, but part of me thinks there's so there's kind of an embarrassment of riches right here already and throwing another thing into the mix might just be an unnecessary complication. So, so I'm really not sure either way. Okay, well, we can always pull a card later if, if okay. needs be. Jeff, of the cards we have chosen from the Story Engine decks, what do you think the premise would be with our story here? Well, I'm, I wouldn't know what to come up with as a premise at this point because it's so wide open in terms of possibilities. And each new story idea comes to you in a different way. And sometimes there's a premise built right into it from the beginning. Like in the live training I'm doing now with people five days a week, we're building a romantic comedy. And the idea that I came up with was one of my favorite movies, which is uh, My Favorite Year with Peter O'Toole, directed by Richard Benjamin. It's about a drunken movie star and this guy has to babysit him while he's in town to be part of the Sid Caesar show based on a true story with Errol Flynn. Um, and it's a great movie. Peter O'Toole is amazing in it. And I thought, well, so if this guy has to babysit uh, this, this actor, it's a, and the actor is about to get thrown out of the country, so the woman who's babysitting him, a kind of a corporate, I can get it done type, to keep him from getting thrown out of the country, she marries him. And so it was my favorite year meets the proposal. And I was like, that's 
we can have fun with that and you can like see the premise in it right away. Like it's kind of sitting there. Whereas this is more just like somebody dumped a, a, a Lego set out on the floor and you could build anything out of it, you know, from like a mermaid to a, a warship to a, a castle to, you know, a meal. It's like you could, and this feels like that. It's, it's really dynamic. It has a real kind of Philip K. Dick warp to it, or no, it's susceptible to having a Philip K. Dick warp incorporated into it. Um, and it also reminds me of uh, the Alfred Bester book, The Star's My Destination, which is considered one of the top science fiction books of all time. But in it, there's a robot that's a bartender. It looks like an 1890s kind of steampunk robot, but it's, no, one of the characters is radioactive in the story and he can only be around people for like 29 minutes at a time. And he's in the room, they're having a really high level meeting toward the end of the story and this guy comes in who's radioactive and they're really getting down to brass tacks, trying to pressure the main character into doing something. And his radioactivity sets, up, sets off the robot who's the bartender who's serving them drinks. And he, the, the robot starts getting whacked out and the main character asks, poses a question to the robot and it comes up with an interesting answer because of the radioactivity. So there's, there's um, dynamic possibilities in that and it reminds me of an Alfred Bester short story called Fondly Fahrenheit where this guy has a very high level robot that can paint like Michelangelo, you know, write poetry like Lord Byron, whatever, and like it can do anything and he can hire it out and make great money, but something goes wrong with it and it goes crazy and it kills a little girl. So then he has to go to a different planet and they're looking for, you know, like this super high end robot. So he makes its capabilities less. It can still go out and make money for him, but it can't sculpt like Michelangelo anymore because they'll find him right away. And then it kills somebody else. So he keeps going on the run with the robot. He can't enable it to do as much. And the robot, it turns out, is overheating and starts doing this kind of schizoid dance where it's like dancing a rumba and chanting. And it's just, and so that like a, a, a radioactive robot or there's so many whacked out things you can do to a robot that it's very suggestive. You know, and a robot wants to steal treachery, a death. Um, so there isn't so much like a premise shaping up as just one possible kind of warped direction based on my own science fiction uh, tendencies or the things that I enjoy in a story. I think that I would wanna look at the 36 dramatic situations for a minute because it, it is a spectrum of possibilities the other thing is that <clears throat> as I'm looking ahead to exploring the Enneagram as possibilities for this story, to what degree does an automaton have the full spectrum of emotional complexity that a human has? And obviously, even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, well, it's an AI and they can build all that stuff in these days. But, you know, does the robot have a warped sense of the way the world works because his father used to beat him or something? It's like, at what point does personal history not exist? 
Or, you know, and then, of course, on the other hand, you have the Tyrell Corporation, where Tyrell says, we gift them with memories so that they it makes them easier to control because they don't perceive that they're dying in two years and they have to fight that. They, there's, their emotions, it says it gives them a, a cushion. Um, or like so this. all that is possible. Right. And in fact, the better it can be done, the more potentially scary this robot can be or more heroic this robot could be depending, and it could be both at the same time. And there you get into the element of dilemma, like is the robot programmed, secretly programmed for treachery, even while it acts wonderful and enlightened and polite, uh, like C-3PO or something, whereas R2-D2 will fricking laser you into dust if that's what it takes, whereas C-3PO would be like, are you sure that's quite polite or to, to, to vaporize that fellow? So that the, the, the um, competing commands in the robot's programming and can create an intriguing dilemma. And the more complexity of personality and character that the robot has, the more compelling the story can potentially be. Now we could possibly pull another agent card if we wanted to bring in, let's say, a B character, and maybe some of the moral dilemma would fall on that character, maybe because they're uh, not an AI and they, they no, have- No, I, I would want the dilemma to be, to, to be in the protagonist. Okay, all right. But we still need a good, strong villain. We definitely need other players. But we're approaching this in an interesting way that we have a handful of dynamic elements. And as, and I think that the 36 dramatic situations will be useful. I'll pull that out in a minute. It's things like ambition, madness, disaster, those kind of things. Right. And I think that as some possibilities begin to gel, that will inform choices for a good, strong antagonist. In other words, the story will help define who the best protagonist might be and other main characters as well. We're going to test the story that you're coming up with from the story engine with the 36 dramatic situations and Enneagram and various things. I'm wondering, should we name this protagonist? For me, that would be premature because it's so kind of explosively open-ended at this point. And one of my favorite points in the development of a story is the point where the sky's the limit, like, any, this, this story, there's dozens of possible stories in this. And I want to kind of like play in the lava, like Superman playing in lava, like just sort of revel in the open-ended possibilities rather than starting to consolidate. And the, the name at one, from one point of view is like a detail, but I don't want to restrict any of the apertures in this at this point because the automaton could be male, it could be female, it could be a deity of a sort, uh, you know, that lives inside a machine and presents as one robot, but it really isn't just that. There's so many wildly open-ended possibilities that I would prefer to sort of arrive at that detail a little bit later. Fair enough, okay. So we have your book here, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and this is just the list of the 36 dramatic situations. Great. And it's just, it was created in the 1700s by an Italian playwright named Carlo Gazzi. It was endorsed by Goethe and Schiller. And on the strength of those endorsements hung around for 150 years or something until George Pulte turned it into a book in 1916. And it says that basically, 
You can describe any story quite completely with these 36 dramatic situations like pursuit, disaster, falling prey to cruelty or misfortune, revolt, daring enterprise. They're elements. And you can describe any story quite completely from one point of view with the 36 dramatic situations in the same way that I can describe this table quite completely from one point of view with the periodic table of elements. So this table is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, magnesium. And so from one point of view, you can describe it quite completely. And so let's see what I'm seeing here. So supplication, asking or begging for help is interesting because <clears throat> if we have an automaton and the need to steal something and a death or a medicine, and there might be treachery involved. So could the automaton be asking or begging for help? Is the automaton being asked, asked or begged for help? It's interesting. And at this point, it all just goes into the cauldron, which is just like a bunch of bubbling ideas that we're trying to, in which we're trying to create life in a certain way. So deliverance, rescuing or being rescued. It seems like that's what this story would be about in a number of ways. Um, you know, an attempt at a rescue. It can be a physical rescue, an emotional rescue, but a deep, strong need for something like that. Then there's crime pursued by vengeance. Has something been done that either is a crime or can be perceived as a crime um, for which vengeance is sought? And crime pursued by vengeance is very context sensitive because someone might take personal affront to something that is quite harmless, but they see it as a crime against them and they're all flared up about it where other people would be like, that's nothing. So it's very per perception sensitive of who sees what as a crime. And there's all varying degrees of crime, but it indicates that something's been done wrong and something substantial has to be done about it, which fits in a story with these elements. Vengeance taken for kindred upon kindred, it's infighting, getting even with your dad for beating up your mom, for your mom upon your dad. The infighting is interesting. It suggests possibilities and could certainly be active, especially if there's like a large corporation with competing interests and infighting and opposing ethics or something like that. Pursuit, very much so, like in pursuit of something, especially if you're dealing like with a medicine or something like that, like the need to cure something, but also being pursued by. You know, is this robot trying to achieve something and there's other people trying to stop that from happening? So pursuit could certainly be active in all of this. Disaster, number six, is... You know, it certainly suggests possibilities that would be inherent in this idea. And disaster can be like, you know, the end of the world all the way down to a bad hair day. So it's varying. It's and it's, again, perception driven because, you know, somebody in Beverly Hills getting their poodle dyed the wrong shade of pink can be like a world ending disaster for that person. So. It again is like what is perceived as a disaster. So the robot might have to prevent a disaster. And if that robot does that, then one party in that story might perceive the robot saving everything as a huge disaster. In the same way that everybody cheers when World War II ends except Adolf Hitler. For him, it's a, it's a massive disaster. For everybody else, it's like 
thank God we finally beat them, that kind of thing. Falling prey to cruelty or misfortune. You know, if you're like ordering an AI to do something that goes against its ethics, then it's like, why me? Why am I? How did I end up being put in this position? I hate that I have to kill somebody or disappear something or steal something or, you know, just falling prey to cruelty or misfortune is pretty self-evident. Now, revolt is quite interesting, a rebellion. And that could be like what's going on with the antagonist. It could be the, you know, the, an the android, the automaton, the robot could be leading a revolt. It can be a secret revolt. It can be a global revolt. It can be a boardroom revolt where there's only two people involved and that'll influence the trajectory of the company. You know, is this automaton unexpectedly sort of turning into a Robin Hood or something? Um, and Revolt was absolutely at the core of Blade Runner, where the replicants are trying to undo their four-year lifespan. Daring enterprise, you know, doing something bold and adventurous goes along with rebellion if you're in that kind of context. But it's interesting in terms of looking at it, looking at an, an automaton who is programmed and probably imbued with a certain personality and character to have a situation force this robot to sort of violate their programming and become more adventurous, more daring. And they may not learn that until the end, or that may be something they have to do early on, but it's an intriguing, it's an intriguing thing, abduction, uh, abduction, kidnapping, or like psychologically taking control of someone is intriguing and interesting. The enigma, the riddle, the mystery. You know, if this robot is being told to accomplish something and yet the robot suspects the ethics of the person who gave that command, um, then the riddle of like, isn't this wrong? Or why is part of me like, know it's wrong and part of me knows I have to do it and doesn't question it at all? You know, so is it like potentially the formation of a conscience in a robot that was designed to not have one, even if it's like a, a perfect warrior that like you say, kill that, it just kills that. But if it begins to grow a conscience because of the way it's being tortured by its master or whatever, like you have to violate your ethics to achieve my goal, then as part of the robot's like, absolutely. And part of the robot's like, I didn't even know I could question that. And I can't let my master know that. But part of my brain is like, something's wrong with this. So the enigma, like what's really going on? Who's really up to what? And then the internal mechanics of the automaton, like, why am I even asking these questions? And I'm the least suited person to sort out the ethics of this situation because I was designed without ethics or I was designed with nothing but ethics. Part of me is supposed to think everything through challenge everything deeply and try to do the right thing. You can see how it's like wildly open-ended and I'm just kind of playing with possibilities. And it's kind of, kind of like what will happen is like, which of these jump out and grab me by the throat the most? That's probably what will emerge as the elements with which to form the premise. Obtaining is pretty straightforward. All different types of people are trying to obtain stuff. Animosity between kin, infighting would be natural in this type of thing. Rivalry between kinsmen, competitiveness, murderous adultery, possibly because we're dealing with a death. Um, and so death can certainly come with adultery and that might be something that's confusing to an android. I don't know, madness. Madness is quite interesting. 
because this type of situation seems to infer that somebody's definitely cracked and has a substantial agenda that is contrary to a lot of normal societal moral values. But is the robot going crazy? Um, does the robot need to go crazy to assert autonomy? Um, the situation can be madness. Uh, we have fatal imprudence doing something unwise, which can have fatal consequences, but it doesn't have to be literally fatal. The less, the less um, literally you take these situations, the more use you can get out of them. So fatal imprudence could be just saying something to your spouse and you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Now he or she'll be pissed off all day. And it's not like anything ended, but it was fatal for the mood that day. So it is all varying degrees of everything. Um, But an automaton that is programmed to execute with an extreme degree of capability and all that might still almost intentionally push the wrong button and set in action a set of things that could be fatal to the antagonist. Even if part of the robot is like, don't push the wrong button and the other, and it just does it where it's like it's kind of fighting itself. So madness inside the robot potentially too and fatal imprudence. Slaying of a kinsman unrecognized. Literally that means like you stab somebody in the dark and find out later it was your brother. But it can also be like someone metaphorically feeling slain and unrecognized. Like a dad comes home drunk and his, his little girl comes running out and says, hey daddy and the dad is you know really out of it and is like I don't gotta leave me alone, and the little girl feels slain and unrecognized. I, you know I'm his little darling, he never did that to me before. I really feel slain, so there's so much metaphoric flexibility in that. But the idea of like an automaton always being treated a certain way by a master, and then the master says. I know you've been programmed to do this all the time, but today you have to do this. And the robot could be like, why did he tell me to do that? Like, he knows what I've been programmed for. You know, I'm an artist. I'm a, what, I'm a, you know, I'm a top medical researcher. It could be anything, but I was designed to save lives and he just told me to poison somebody. It's like, you know, I feel slain and unrecognized. So there's possibilities like that. Self-sacrifice for an ideal. The robot could be faced with that. Self-sacrifice for kindred to save others. All sacrificed for a passion. It's interesting, you know. It reminds me of Data in Star Trek who was you know, rigorously perfect in logic and all these things. And yet one of his deepest hungers was to know what it felt like to be human or to get a joke or something like that. Because he was like, that doesn't make any sense. How, why are you laughing? What is laughter, you know? So all sacrificed for a passion, like Data's hunger to be human could lead him to sacrifice some parts of some mission to get a chance to experience what it's like to be a human for an hour or something like that. So this robot, if it's really caught in a really intense dilemma, could make certain key choices that violate its programming, break it out of certain things, open up new possibilities. The necessity of sacrificing loved ones yeah, that could be what the robot is faced with doing. And it can go both ways. Does the maker of the robot have to sacrifice the robot to achieve his or her end? Adultery, I don't know, crimes of love, discovery of the dishonor of a loved one, the finding out you've been betrayed. Interesting, like the robot discovers that the master has betrayed them or the master discovering the robot didn't obey orders. Obstacles to love. 
is certainly inherent in there, and enemy loved. That's really interesting because that means not just falling in love with an enemy, which happens, but also respect for an enemy or fascination with an enemy. Uh, and so if the robot is caught between like the commands of its master and the intriguing aspects of like a rebel leader who somehow begins interacting with this automaton and has a fascinating argument, the robot may find itself fascinated by this enemy and respecting the enemy, maybe even growing to love the values that the enemy brings to the table, and yet knowing full while that I shouldn't even be talking to this person, much less incorporating some of their values into my operating system. Ambition, absolutely. Clearly, if there's like a master of this robot who has vast ambitions and maybe a huge corporation and like if they can cheat this one thing, then you go from being, you know, a hundred billion dollar corporation to a ten trillion dollar corporation and they're willing to do whatever it takes and the robot could be caught in the middle of all that. And the robot's ambitions, like we were talking about data wanting to be human. And one of the things here was, um, what was it? It means giving up their dream. Like that speed, like what kind of dream might a robot have? Um, you know, and this, this robot could have been to Jupiter 20 times, like seen the whole solar system, like been on fire on the surface of Mercury and been rebuilt. And like all it wants to do is like, curl up with a good book in front of a fire or lay on the beach like it's like it wants it's done all the the most incredible stuff it just wants a simple little cozy moment they talk about that in tibetan mythology about how the gods often want to become human they're sick of being all wise all knowing all seeing and they just want to be immortal and have like a little house and a white picket fence and be finite and not know everything which is kind of where data was coming from in a certain way, and this character could certainly be doing that. So ambition is kind of explosively active in a whole bunch of possible ways. Conflict with a god works in two key ways that I see right off the bat, like the automaton is in conflict with its commander, its boss, and there's conflicting commands, that kind of stuff, confusing commands, commands that can't be obeyed but must be. And I've often thought the, with Robbie the robot, he says, you know, Robbie's like, eh, 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 and he really can't fire, but he can't not fire. And he releases him from the command. He says, if I leave him like this, he'll melt down. But the model that I work with in terms of dramatizing a story is you put your protagonist in a good strong dilemma, similar to like Jake in Training Day where he can't let go of this amazing opportunity to make Alonzo's squad, his ambition. He can't let go of his ambition, but he can't go down the slippery moral slope that Alonzo's leading him on because it's more and more criminality and risk and danger. So he can't let go of his ambition, but he can't let go of his moral compass. And then that dilemma comes to a critical juncture when Alonzo tries to have him killed in the bathtub by the hillside gang members. And once he gets out of that, he makes a decision about his dilemma, which is I'm taking Alonzo down no matter what. And his action is to go in there and try to arrest him. And so I often thought that it's almost an interesting analogy if you could get to that robot that is short circuiting. And it's like, it really can't send a command in either direction. And I don't know what the best way to say it is, but kind of override the operating system and tell the robot, you must decide now. And like it, you know, is it gonna blow up? Is it, what's it gonna do? But it's like, when push comes to shove, could you make that short circuiting robot arrive at some kind of decision 
from within its programmed architecture, that type of thing, and take some kind of action, which fits, which, which relates to this story, because we potentially have a robot that's really melting down between two unacceptable commands, two commands that cannot, neither one can be obeyed, but must be obeyed. He can't disobey orders, but he can't harm a human being in Robbie the Robot. So conflict with a god is interesting. The robot is up against its creator, its master, and yet, and that is presumably the antagonist, although not necessarily. And yet, could this commander be up against this robot that is godlike in its capacity and in its linkage or hidden linkage to all the uh, capabilities of this you know, massive manufacturing facility, kind of like HAL or something like that, where there's uh, tremendous capability. So going up against this robot can be risky and you're up against sort of all the, the fail-safe mechanisms, mechanisms that you built into the robot as you try and outwit it or defeat it or overpower it. Erroneous judgment, making a bad choice, the robot could make a bad choice, the master, there could be key wrong choices, remorse, the robot could grow to have remorse, which it didn't used to have, the boss could have absolutely no remorse, the recovery of a lost one, you know, gaining something back that's been lost, um, or attempting to gain a person that's been lost, even bring someone back from the dead. Um, you know, if, if there's a key death in this story, and we saw that in uh, I, Robot with Will Smith, that the character played by James Cromwell was killed at the beginning of the story, and yet the Will Smith character is interacting with a hologram of the James Cromwell character who's trying to give him clues but it was all pre-recorded before James Cromwell's death. So he keeps saying, if you want an answer to that, you have to ask the right question. So it was all in there, but he couldn't access it until he figured out what the right question was. If someone died, like say the boss who's trying to make the robot do a certain thing, maybe is the son of the person that actually built the robot and the father recently died and now this, the son sort of inherits command of the robot's operating system and is doing things that are counter, counter to what the father would have done and yet still fit within that groove so the robot still believes it has to obey, but it's like going, I, I, I don't like this. And so if the father's elements of the father's mind or something were computerized or emulated by computers. They did this with expert systems. A classic example was Campbell's Soup, where the guy who'd been in charge of making the big vats of soup for 30 years was getting ready to retire. And they, they created an expert system in which he downloaded all his knowledge and all the variables. Like if it tastes too salty, you know, you put in cornstarch or whatever, like a certain amount. And they basically just debriefed everything he knew so that a machine could emulate much of his knowledge and, and some of his instincts. So that if some aspect of the master had been, and possibly even secretly, because the, the old man knew that his son might go this way, so that he may have been laying preparation. So um, the possibility that the robot is secretly trying to like bring the original founder back to life to some degree for guidance or to countermand the order or to even regenerate the person physically, like make a clone of them and then download a mind into them 
you know, these are all just dynamic possibilities to play with. And you can see how as I'm going through the 36, I'm trying each one on like in varying ways and different possibilities. Um, so recovery of a lost one, that's where that came from. And then loss of loved ones. You know, like maybe the robot brings the old man back for a while and that really helps the robot kind of become more human and have more free will like the like the original master might say you can do anything you want like we programmed all this stuff into you but you still have tremendous latitude and maybe i can even go in and undo some of those deep commands like you can never disobey maybe that maybe the founder serves a function at a key moment and then you know, like even if there's like a physical person in front of him who is the, the man, maybe he only lives for 20 minutes. So there's still loss of loved ones, but it's enough to kind of like free the automaton from the perceived limits that were binding the automaton. It's the, the, the classic example that psychiatrists use a lot is um, elephants when they're young, like a circus elephant, to be restrained is hooked up to a really strong chain that you could tow a truck with and into a really big stake in the ground and it knows it can't get away. I mean, it tries, but as it grows up, it gets so used to being chained that they just put a little two by two in the ground with a piece of clothesline and the robot still is like, up. Oh, that's as far as I can go. When the, did I say robot? I meant elephant. The, the adult elephant could, you know, could shred that, but they're, they're trained to that, and that could be something similar to the robot and where the original founder might say, look, you, you've incorporated all these habits into your daily life, and you're like the adult elephant that's still restrained by a piece of clothesline. You know, you, you are a creature of tremendous power, and you're capable of anything, and don't think small, don't let your program, which is perfect metaphor for people in the real world, having tremendous capability, but believing that they're small and worthless and easily controlled and all that. So that's an interesting element. And that was just, you know, from just going through this one complete spectrum of ideas that can trigger possibilities. Um, and we were, you know, <clears throat> looking at each one of those situations kind of through the lens of all of these combined in varying degrees. And I really like the, um, and see what it is is that some of those stuck, I said some of them will jump out and grab me by the throat. Like I really like the son and the father and possibly the father killed the son and the father had more morals than the son, and the son is going to take a corporation worth 200 billion and make it worth 20, 20 trillion, like within three months. But he needs the robot, you know, to withhold a medicine or create a disease, create a contagion that the medicine is a cure for, and, you know, a billion people die, and then they come up with the cure, and then 8 billion people each spent a hundred dollars on and all of a sudden this corporation's worth eight trillion like literally overnight on its way to being worth 80 trillion a year from now. But who has to die for that progress and can the robot deal with the ethics and make a right choice when it's supposed to just be a robot that just, you know, keeps putting the hubcap on the new car without anything else. So an automaton who is a, perceived as a servant and a puppet and a machine, like you push the button and it puts the hubcap on, wants to steal or wants to stop the theft of, both of them are interesting because they, they infer two opposite commands potentially. Um, like protect or destroy or 
the, the founder wants the theft to be stopped and the new one wants it to steal. Or probably more interesting is that the AI of the founder is recommending to the robot that it steal to prevent the sun from consolidating this new um, empire. <clears throat> and a medicine going hand in hand with a contagion is interesting in terms of um, manipulating a global uh, you know, a, gl a global um, con. A death is interesting because we were talking about how the founder died and was maybe murdered. Even a hospital is interesting because if this is similar perhaps to the Tyrell Corporation, then a lot of a, a, per, a healthy percentage of the setting could take place in a hospital like corporate manufacturing facility and all this kind of subterranean access, almost hidden tunnels or underworld aspects that the robot might be able to incorporate. The innocent will suffer. Yeah, if it's going to take a billion people to die of this contagion to sell $8 trillion worth of this medicine that they've had for years, then that's, uh, that's something the robot has to wrestle with. But it means giving up their dream. Well, if this robot is designed to be extremely helpful to humanity, kind of altruistic and yet has been counter-programmed to cause great harm or allow great harm to happen, and yet is stuck in the middle trying to resolve that dilemma, that could certainly, like the robot might be programmed to be so altruistic that its dream is to have everyone healthy, happy, doing well. And it's kind of simplistic, but it's like starting somewhere within the context of the story we're playing with here. Uh, like the robot's natural inclination to altruism is being contravened or corrupted by the sun. But what's on the opposite side of that? Like, obviously, the sun cares if they're worth eight trillion tomorrow. But what does that give the robot? <clears throat> it certainly opens up the possibility for solving a whole lot more stuff, but the sun doesn't seem to have that natural inclination to use this eight trillion to solve world hunger. Almost the opposite. So that's an interesting means giving up their dream. And it certainly could be, you know, that the robot dreams of being human, dreams of being retired at the end of its sort of indentured servitude and get to live like a person for a while or something. That may have been something that was always promised to it or something. And then treachery, glorious. Obviously, the sun could be treacherous. But the robot could be treacherous in what it does to outwit the sun. And the father could promote that treachery. Like, you got to think around the evil of my son, because if you don't, he's going to beat you. you got to fight dirty to beat him, because all he does is fight dirty. So I feel like I've got more of a handle on a potential story there 
I don't feel like I have a premise yet, but I feel like we've kind of cobbled together something that's interesting and dynamic and has high stakes and complexity and a dilemma of magnitude for this automaton, an interesting ally in the form of the old man, a potential strong villain in the form of the sun. Um, so that's a good, we've kind of gotten to a platform here where we've got something that feels much more solid than just a open-ended set of possibilities. Um, we've kind of cooked it down a little bit and have more of a something there. You talk about dilemma, which is part of your tools. Yeah, and that would be pretty much what I go to next. Because the way that I work with dilemma is I'm looking at that right from the outset in developing the story. Like you can see that even as I'm playing with this broad array of possibilities for this story, I keep coming back to, well, if the robot had been programmed to do this and, you know, like what's unacceptable to the robot and what might be equally unacceptable and you know, how does that, how is that impacted by commands that are given by the robot's operating system, um, by the robot's sense of morality? One of my favorite quotes, which I thought about for a flickering second about a half an hour ago, uh, it's by a writer, George Saunders. And he says, um, character is the governing element of life and is above genius. And real character is something that's very important. And mere genius is just some other smart dude who could be completely crazy, but he's wicked smart and it's like, but he's destructive or... He, you know, it's like, it's it's just genius. Uh, you know, like kind of like throw a stick and you can hit a genius, but half of them are screwed up. You know, character is, is substantial. And that could be something that the robot is really wrestling with. And I really like the, the image of Data, the character who's, I think it had a positronic brain. It was absolute state-of-the-art computer technology built into an Android. I don't know if it synthesized human and robot or if it's just a pure machine. But his hunger for humanity and curiosity about aspects and foibles of humanity is Intriguing. It was something you know, I haven't seen that show in many, many years, but I always liked Data. And I remember one show he even became human for a half an hour in the holodeck or something like that. But at the end of it all, he understands what a joke is. And he's like, oh, that's funny, even though he's no longer in the mindset that had him acting really like a human. Spock did that sometimes too, where he would become more like a, an impulsive wild animal than a rigidly controlled logician. And he'd you know, go into these different states and be goofy and wacky and funny and all that stuff. So just in terms of focusing on trapping this automaton in a dilemma of magnitude, a dilemma that matters to the audience. There's a lot of raw material for that here. And <clears throat> it seems as though there might be altruism on one side, like it's unacceptable to give up a sense of what's right, of doing the right thing, of 
being able to, being capable of doing really powerful, world-changing things. Someone who's kind of like was raised to be a brain surgeon and like they're really trying to do good for people and that's built into who they are and why they operate. So that's an interesting thing to kind of just sit there and let it float, like the need to do good, a moral compass, and even just a moral compass. Knowing what's right and what's wrong. Um, so then to countermand that or to be the opposite of that, but equal, because you want equally unacceptable alternatives. That's where you get that Robbie the Robot short circuiting in between two things. If one, if one side of the, of the dilemma is more unacceptable than the other, then you have a path of least resistance and electricity will always take the path of least resistance. But if you have equal resistance, then you block it, you have impedance and it heats up uh, in electricity. So I know what this automaton looks like caught in this dilemma because it looks literally like Robbie the Robot short-circuiting. Like it can't, it's like eh, 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 unable to process command. And so I know that I want to achieve that, but it's a question of what are the two alternatives that are being sort of not just posed to this automaton, but sort of foisted onto this automaton, forced like Sophie's choice. It's not like, oh, that'll be a fun choice. Which kid do I sacrifice? It's horrible. It's, it's like, I don't want any of this. But it may, it may not be that extreme, but we want something substantial of magnitude that really impacts an audience. And you want not only magnitude, a dilemma that matters to the audience, but you want it to where the audience can relate to it personally. And that's an important aspect of working with dilemma, because if you're trapping a protagonist in a dilemma and the average person in the audience can understand it intellectually but has no emotional connection to it, then they're like, I see what they're talking about, but I don't care. So one of the questions I'm always asking my students is once you have a dilemma trapped between two equally unacceptable alternatives, can the average member of the audience connect to that. And so what I say is like, you know, pick somebody who like lives down the street that you don't even know and sort of study them indirectly. You know, they might be someone who's like, you know, a graduate student in dance and really creative and drives Uber at night to make ends meet. And it's just a regular person down the street. So you've got your character trapped in this dilemma. Can that person down the street that you don't really know or don't know at all, can they connect to that or is it like, because you want your average member of the audience who's just a plumber taking his kids to the movie or whatever, do they see themselves in it? Because if they don't, then they're less connected to it. And they say that the deeper you go, the more universal you get. So if the movie you know, is about you know, a contractor in, France, who's caught up in a tricky situation. It should be so that like, you know, a doctor in Australia can watch that movie and go, I don't know anything about building houses, but his dilemma of like duty versus honor or something like that, like I can totally relate to that. So it's like what we want as we work with developing 
a dilemma for this automaton is to make it so that the average member of the audience looks at that dilemma and goes, wow, I'm caught in the same dilemma. It's a different set of circumstances, but I'm caught in that exact same thing and I don't know how to get out of it. Maybe this robot can f solve the thing that's paralyzing me in a fundamental way. Then the audience cares that much more and it's a visceral connection, it's an emotional connection, not just an intellectual understanding. It's interesting to try to trap this robot in a real quandary. They do a decent job of that in the Will Smith movie, I, Robot. Will Smith hates robots because they tore off his arm at one point. He's a cop. The head of this huge corporation gets thrown off a 30-story landing and Will Smith is brought in to investigate and everybody thinks this robot killed the master. But, and Will Smith hates that suspect robot from the beginning because he's prejudiced against all robots. He hates them all. But he begins to perceive that the robot that is under suspicion has unique insights and is the total opposite of what he thought. Um, and, it's at the, and that robot was actually reprogrammed by the old man before he was killed. And that robot is there to help Will Smith stop the robot corporation from doing something treacherous. I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it's a robot army that they're unleashing on the world to control them. But it's interesting because Because that robot is either raising interesting questions in Will Smith's mind or Will Smith is raising interesting questions in the robot's mind. I can't recall, but that's just a movie I've seen that has similarities to this type of potential story. And like I can feel the presence of the dilemma even if I'm not able to articulate it clearly at this point because I'm still kind of inventing what these two equally unacceptable alternatives could be. But I know, I know how that robot feels trapped in that type of situation. I have an emotional connection to what that does to this robot. And So as I sort of try to conjure what these things might be, <clears throat> it can be helpful to look ahead to the point of crisis where the dilemma comes to a critical juncture around the three quarters point in the movie around the end of act two. Because we want the dilemma to kick in somewhere around the end of act one where we've, we've gotten to know the main character, the story's developed, and as, as the story gets up to speed, like the full complexity of the story is all kicking in, we want this robot to be trapped in this dilemma of magnitude either before the end of Act 1 or by the end of Act 1. And we want that dilemma to extend throughout Act 2 where the dilemma goes critical. Prior to that, the robot is like, I can't pick in either direction. And the same with Jake Hoyt in Training Day. I can't let go of this opportunity, but I can't do what Alonzo is trying to get me to do. Uh, and so that dilemma is going to go critical around the end of Act Two. And then the protagonist has to make a decision about the dilemma and take an action about it now that it's gone critical. And then the ending of the story is the resolution of the dilemma, the active resolution of the dilemma by the protagonist that conclusively resolves the dilemma. So the dilemma is like fully engaged before the end of Act 1 or around the end of Act 1. It builds an intensity all throughout Act 2 to the point where it 
reaches this critical juncture that forces the protagonist to make a decision and take an action about the dilemma that he or she couldn't previously decide about. And then the end is the resolution of the dilemma. So the dilemma encompasses most of the proportion of the script. It's not something that happens for five minutes in the story. It's something that takes up most of the story. And if you look at the movie um, Almost Famous by Cameron Crowe, he won best screenplay for that. He said, the, the kid who's the reporter, he said, he, he, re, he can't become friends with the band because then he's no longer an objective reporter. And if he does become friends with them, they'll try to make him write about how cool they are. So he, he loves this band. It's unacceptable to not become friends with them because they're the coolest creatures around and he's uncool. So he's desperate for that. And yet his mentor, the Philip Seymour Hoffman character says, do not become their friend because they'll make you into a puppet and write about how great they are. You want to be an objective reporter and really stick to your guns on that. And Cameron Crowe said, that dilemma is what the movie's about. And if you look at it again, you can see that constitutes the full proportion of the script. It takes a little bit of time of setup to get to get to know him. He gets in with the band, starts traveling with them. But after he's really in there, he has great opportunities to become friends with them, but he really wants to be a good reporter. So the dilemma is constitutes much of the proportion of the script. And the way I describe it sometimes is like it's like a whale in your living room. It doesn't take up every square inch, but it takes up the full thing. You can still walk around it and stuff, but it's not a little thing in the middle of your living room. It's the dilemma is constitutes the full proportion of the script. So all of that to say that as I work to conjure what these two equally unacceptable alternatives could be that paralyze the protagonist for much of the script, one way to um, see what these might be more clearly is to look ahead to the point of crisis. Like, okay, so at some point, this dilemma is gonna to come to a make or break point, which is very much the gun to the head on the protagonist. Like, you don't get to spend any more time thinking about how you're gonna, what kind of decision you're gonna make about this dilemma. You have to decide now. That's the nature of a crisis. It demands immediate decision and action. And so sometimes looking ahead to what the crisis might look like can help you see what this is by sort of looking through the opposite end of the telescope or seeing it from a different point. So if I'm this robot and I'm trapped and I can really feel these things, I just don't know exactly what they are yet and that's okay. But at some point, there's gonna be a make or break crisis about this dilemma. Yeah, and it's really about morality like versus ambition, I think. Like if the son of the leader is gonna make $8 trillion overnight, I can see the robot feeling morality, but does a robot have that type of ambition? Like, does it care about $8 trillion? I don't know. I mean, like, <clears throat> I have 13-year-old girls, and they're very aware of money now and like it and are interested. But, you know, when they're eight, you know, they get Christmas money or and we, like, put it on their desk. And they, like, didn't pay any attention to it. We'd find it, like, you know, under a book the next week. Or they just, they didn't, it didn't mean anything to them yet. So, like... To what degree might an automaton value this massive amplification of power and possibility and all that? And certainly if it's an AI, then it could certainly have been imbued with characteristics of the owner that 
growing the company is really important and is important to the survival of the business, even survival of the automaton. If the business gets shut down, then maybe the plug gets pulled on the, autom on the automaton. But it seems as though like being raised by the owner, programmed or created, I don't know if the money is as important as the capability. You know, so is the, is the son <clears throat> telling the robot, look, some people are going to die in the process of this, or maybe the robot comes back and says, you know, this plan you're putting in place, a whole lot of people are going to die. And, you know, maybe the robot hadn't really connected that yet. And the owner is like, well, yeah, but that... You know, that's how progress is often made. And the thing is that if our company achieves this monopoly, then our capability to help so many more people and, in other words, appeal to the altruism of the robot or the moral compass or something like that is possible. And you can see I'm just kind of feeling my way along with it. And, you know, I'm not even sure what an ambitious robot even looks like. Uh, but it's programming. It's compulsion. It's, you know, like more, not so much more is better, but more enables more function, more capability, more something. It's puzzling, like I'm not sure. <clears throat> so, but, so I'm not exactly sure what the crisis is, but I can see a sense of what decision and action in the face of crisis might look like. Because the, para the, the crisis breaks the paralysis of the dilemma. It forces a decision and action. And they say, uh, Aristotle said that decision and action in the face of crisis reveals the true character. It strips the mask off. You, like you don't know who your real friends are until you've been through a crisis with them. The classic example is the big strong guy jumps up and runs out screaming, the little guy jumps up and saves the day. So you don't know what people are really made of until they're forced by a crisis to show what they're really made of. And I could see the robot really trying to do the right thing at the point of crisis. But to get to the resolution, which is the resolution, the conclusive proactive resolution of the dilemma by the protagonist, once the robot takes a stand to try to do the right thing at the critical moment, then he's got to fight to the finish with the son to get through the last 15 minutes of this movie in a real knockdown drag out fight that the robot may well lose. Uh, and there could certainly be a creative resolution for the automaton but it's going to have to grow and think differently and disobey key things and cleave more closely to key things. Some values that it's been programmed to value, to, to you know, uphold will be shattered and some values that it's been programmed to want will be amplified as the way the way people do in real life. So the one thing that's really crystalline is decision and action. I can see the robot is really going to try to do the right thing. Um, so does that inform 
what the dilemma consists of. Let me just. Sure. And I just thought of something too that might be driving the sun aside from money, and that is the notoriety and fame that will come with the, the you know, and he's the, the, the son of this sort of brainchild, and then, you know, he's the, you know, he, maybe social media wasn't around when the father was building the company. And now maybe the son is not 30 yet, and now he'll be the, you know, successful 30 under 30. And so there's all this, uh, you know, press that he wants. Yeah. And that's also driving him. Yeah. You know. Which is also kind of madness and sure. that kind of stuff, the narcissism and the the need for power. And maybe the father was never around because he was just working 19 hours a day. And the kid has a, you know, a sort of out of proportion need to be loved or to impress or to be validated. <clears throat> maybe, yeah, his whole identity was, um, yeah. I mean, I growing up in the Bay Area, I knew people that their children were, you know, from someone's owned a tech company and that was the first thing out of their mouth. And, and it, you know, wasn't always the healthiest dynamics, right. but it was high and my father is so-and-so. And I think that's a very real thing. And unfortunately, yeah. it just happens. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe he needs that. It's driving him. And also the social media accolades and the press to be in all of the financial papers. As, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and we want to build complexity into that, but that's where the Enneagram is so useful to dimensionalize that sun in a way where you understand the sun, but you still see him as a monster, but he still has very interesting aspects. And um, you know, you see up and coming business owners who are really ruthless with their competitors. And then after they make it big, they're like giving money away to everybody, but they destroyed multiple businesses to get there. So it's like, you know, again, it's the, the ambition versus moral compass type thing. Now, the other interesting model for Dilemma to try on is something that comes from my knowledge of Tootsie, which is that Michael Dorsey's uh, a male actor who's very talented actor, but a huge pain in the ass to work with. And he's really inept at relating to women. Um, and when he dresses up as a woman and gets hired, all of a sudden he's got a career, a fat paycheck, respect as an actor, and relationships with women that he wasn't capable of doing as Michael now that he's Dorothy. And he sees women from a totally different point of view now that he's Dorothy. And he becomes, Dorothy becomes a crusader for women's rights, whereas Michael was kind of the person she'd be crusading against. So, and, and there's all kinds of ways in which becoming Dorothy is disrupting Michael's life in both major and minor ways. So Michael can't let go of Dorothy because it's the best thing that ever happened to him, but he can't keep being her because it's the worst thing that ever happened to him. And it kind of cooked down to like, Dorothy is creating him like literally making him a better person and destroying him, like kind of taking him apart as all these things happen. So I'm like, I wanna like try that on for a possibility for this automaton. Is there a way that this situation is offering a lot of potential upscale to the robot and yet is also destroying. Now, here's something that could actually drive a robot or give a robot ambition. So what if <clears throat> we talked about the possibility of the robot regenerating the old man in humanoid form, even if it only is 20 minutes, based on sneaking around to use the equipment in the in the manufacturing facility, kind of like, you know, the Tyrell Corporation where they can make people. Um, 
could the son tell the automaton, stick with me and help me pull this off? We'll make $8 tri trillion overnight. We'll be worth $80 trillion this time next year. And we'll be getting up towards a quadrillion in five years, like, boom, like, we can now move on to the master plan of actually genetically building people so you, the automaton, could have a human body and actually walk around and get cut and have BO and go surfing and, you know, get sunburned, like all the things that you've always wanted. See, that's something that could really, like the robot is like, I want that. And almost like an out of proportion, irrational, like I'm desperate to have that. Nothing's gonna make me let go of that. But I'm also being asked to, look, help execute a billion people with this contagion so that we can sell the cure for it. And that's gonna make me human. And so, See how I was like, I was feeling around for how can a robot be ambitious? What does he care about? Does money mean anything at all to him? But that, like, that's something. And it's, you know, it's Pinocchio, you know, the, the wants to be a real boy. Um, <clears throat> and it taps into data. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to come from a place that necessarily makes sense from the outside. So it's not, you look at that from outside and be like, no, that's way more, killing a billion people is way more unacceptable than not becoming human. But if we're dealing with like madness to some degree, this outsized hunger in this automaton to be human, that it's irrational, but it's extremely real for this automaton. And is a really deep need that really drives this machine that probably has a soul, a conscience, or a personality Soul is such an ambiguous word, but um, something that might emulate human personality quite well. So it's not missing that, but it wants a human body quite a lot. <clears throat> and the sun could even influence the automaton's operating system like with a virus that makes it like more greedy to be human, sort of take that irrational drive and amplify it. Um, see now there's, see how I was like, I'm not sure what these are. There's something, there's one of them right there. And yes, it's a real challenge to like, for this one main creature that we like and are rooting for, to really want that, we can, we can get behind that. But when we look at it, becoming human versus helping kill a billion people, we're, it has to be handled right so that we keep rooting for this android. Uh, because if, if the android starts going, hum diddy, I can't wait to kill a billion people and eat hot dogs on the beach, we're like, I'm not rooting for this creature anymore. You know, it's like you have to get the audience sympathy, or I think the better word is empathy, because it's not like pity. Sympathy infers pity, but audience empathy, like they're really rooting for this character. You have to get the audience empathy and keep it. You can get it and then lose it if you don't handle it right. So this has to be handled right so that the need to become human has some kind of perceived equalness 
in the mind of this automaton based on this automaton's skewed perception of the world, um, like think of all the things you can do in a body. First of all, maybe that body won't age. You know, we're gonna put you in a body, but 400 years from now, it'll still be 27 and you'll still be the, the best surfer on the beach and like whatever. And you can be brain sir, you can, you, can, you can change the face, you were designed to change the face of humanity even. You know, and these billion people who are gonna die, they're already starving. They're not gonna live that much longer. They're sickly, they're in, you know, it's like, the more that the sun can amplify the capabilities of this, AI put in a human body that can, you know, last a thousand years versus the fate of these people who are already going to die anyway. It's like, it's like getting somebody with terminal cancer and sending them in as a suicide bomber. It's like there's people that will sign up for that. So if he has to sacrifice people that are demonstrably not going to live that long anyway, then, and he's like, I can help the other 7 billion people who really need my capabilities as a master healer 10 years from now, and I've really incorporated so much more with, with all the wealth that this company can do, then you begin to, it's not like so wildly uneven from this automaton's point of view, even though we can still go, don't be an idiot, you're still killing a billion people. But I think that's also what he's gonna discover at the point of crisis like that the son's been radically lying to him or something like that, or the, you know, the old man who's back as a human for 20 minutes or whatever is like, he's lying his ass off to you, just like he always did to me. He's a monster. Don't let him get away with this. And then maybe, you know, the son comes in and kills the father again, like, right? Who knows? But um, we have now the elements of a dilemma that have to be managed right, but the deep hunger to become human and be a savior in many ways, like an, an intelligence on an order of magnitude beyond any human that ever lived in a human body that, I mean, I, obviously if you like, you know, you can chainsaw it in half, but it's not gonna, die from a cold or age or those kind of things. And it's, it's interesting and it goes back to the, um, the trick of how they catch monkeys in the Philippines, which is that they take a coconut, hollow it out, make a hole the size of a monkey's hand and put rice inside it, tie it to a tree. The monkey comes along, reaches in there and grabs the rice, but holding the rice, it can't get its hand back out. And the way they catch it is they just walk up to the monkey and grab it and it's screaming its head off. It wants to run, but it will not let go of the rice. Like this android is like, I want life. It's just like what Roy Batty says to Deckard. I want more life, father. Um, so that's interesting. And if the android has been infected with a virus by the sun, that weakens its moral compass, its ethics, its, then there's more gray area and less black and white inside that Android's ethical choice system. Like where it's starting to agree with the sun. Yeah, you know, I could see where 300 million of those people are literally gonna be dead in a week anyway. So that doesn't, mess up my Android conscience. And, you know, it's like he's, he's able to rationalize, which is weird to say for a robot, but the more human they become, the more they get better at rationalization. I, I don't remember what movie it was. It might've been Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Like, did you ever try to go a day without a rationalization? Something like that. That it's key to how people operate. And from my own study of Hamlet, which I was trained on, um, 
the thing that I found about Hamlet, the more I studied it, was that there was a huge discrepancy between what he says he's going to do, which is everything, and what he actually does, which is virtually nothing, is what gets him and the whole royal family killed. Because his, the ghost of his father says, your uncle killed me, go kill him and make things right. And Hamlet, who's a crown prince, who's been raised as a man of action, that comes right to the front. He says, absolutely, I'll go kill him, no problem. But then the more he thinks about it, he's like, was that a trick of the devil? And he's off at college, studying philosophy, chasing girls, sword fighting, riding horses. He has an ideal life. And he's like, do I really want to give all that up to kill my uncle and become king and be stuck in this cold castle with all these shallow backstabbing people around? And so when it comes time to take action, he's not sure if he should, and he lets the chance go by him. And then he beats up on himself. He's like, oh, I should have just done it. All right, so next time, next chance, boy, am I going to do it. And then he doesn't do it again, but he is asking all the right questions. But the next chance he gets to do it, he doesn't. And then he's really angry. He's like, okay, now next time, watch out. I'm going to go crazy. I'm really mad now. Nothing's going to stop me. And he screws up yet again. And so the discrepancy between what he says he's going to do which is everything, and what he actually does, which is practically nothing, comes down to his ability to lie to himself. It's about self-deception, because he believes it when he says, next time I'm really going to do it. But he's lying to himself. And the more I studied Hamlet, the more I grew to hate him, because he's really a screw-up, like literally a royal screw-up. And he's unable to take decisive action in the face of an emergency, and that's why the whole family ends up dying. But his self-deception is the mechanism by which he does that. And everybody has self-deception in varying degrees. And the more that I studied Hamlet and the more I grew to hate him, because I see him as an abject screw-up who can't communicate honestly with himself. So if I notice like, Oh, I'm talking about I'm doing this and doing this, but I'm not actually doing it. I'm like, I'm doing a Hamlet. So get rid of the crap and just do it or whatever, but be honest with yourself. And so it brings up an interesting question of like self-deception in a robot as it becomes more human. It's able to lie to itself to help itself get where it needs to. It's like a negative aspect of becoming human. So that's intriguing. And it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic in the story and something that the sun might be able to amplify by the introduction of a virus that's sort of corroding or corrupting his rigid ethics, like Robbie the robot cannot disobey an order and cannot harm a human being. You know, if one of those things was being corrupted, then maybe he sort of could disobey a command or something like that. It's, it's an interesting thing to play with. So we still don't have a whole lot of particulars yet, but we have a whole lot more than we did 45 minutes ago. And the 36 dramatic situations just like as I looked at ambition, I'm like, so obviously the sun, who we may not have invented by that at that point, the sun could be extremely ambitious. Eight billion, eight trillion dollars overnight. What's not to like? And all that stuff. And could the robot have ambition? And how does a robot have ambition? And you know, what are the ambitions of the founding father or something like that? But you could see how just Thinking about an automaton, need to steal, medicine, innocent will suffer, treachery and glory, wish granting. Looking at ambition through the, lens of the lenses of those raw elements gave rise to several possibilities. And really there was, you know, hundreds of possibilities in, the, in that, but several 
about ambition jumped right out and grabbed me by the throat. Ambition by the protagonist, the automaton, or ambition by the central villain, the son. And that gave us like something to actually grab onto instead of just smoke in a bucket where there wasn't really anything you could grab yet. Now we're beginning to have some things out of which we can cobble together a story and we've gradually been, possibilities have been gelling, a few things have started to really solidify, decision and action even kind of crystallizes, like I can really see that as a hard, real thing. I don't know what the resolution might be. I'm getting more of a sense, well, now that we have the possibility of him becoming human and he's like irrationally over-attracted to that, that can counterbalance the unacceptability of sacrificing a billion people who were gonna die anyway. In other words, it's the ability to lie to yourself and the virus makes him more manipulable and less rigid. You know, it's like when Spock you know, gets some alien fungus and he's laying around like he's on catnip instead of going, that's not logical. You know, so we're like playing with interesting things and creating plot devices like corrupting part of the robot's operating system with a virus makes certain things that we're trying to do more tangible and doable rather than I wish we could had a way to corrupt his operating system, that kind of thing. What's next? I'm really liking how dynamic this story is and how it's, it's loaded with possibility in, in a really fun way. And it made me curious. Uh, there's this thing that's similar to like a tarot reading that's called the Sabian Oracle that works with the Sabian symbols. Um, and you get like a little mini reading from it. Uh, it was somebody who sat down in the 19, an astrologer sat down in the 1920s with a psychic and held up 360 cards, one degrees, two degrees. And she saw an image for each one and he recorded them. So you like focus on a question, trigger it. It's the same thing in Tarot. You think about a question and then pick some cards and you get some kind of reading from it. And I, this is not something I'm into. It's I do it a few times a year out of curiosity. Sometimes it's not worth much. Sometimes it's really interesting. And so just for a story that's this kind of partially formed with a lot of interesting potential, I thought it would be just curious to see what uh, what comes up for it. <clears throat> Wonderful. So, so really I just want to like focus for a minute on what I'm actually questioning. And this would be the intention of your story, the protagonist's journey? It's more like a question. And like, so as I'm focusing, I am find myself in the position of the android, like I'm being the robot and kind of like looking at the world that now confronts me, probably the sun, and in my confusion about the contradictory elements, it's almost like, you know, what is this? I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I'm vocalizing it right. But almost like, what is this story about? And I'm seeing it from the point of view of this like confused robot. The site is, what is the URL of the website? Okay, so here's what it said. A nature spirit dancing in the mist of a waterfall. 
That's what this psychic, that's the image she saw, a nature spirit dancing in the midst of the waterfall. And then there's like an interpretation. So I'm just, the image doesn't do a lot for me right away, but I'm curious the paragraph below it, what that says. It says, this symbol shows skipping lightly over the surface of life, dancing and playing. You may feel emotionally light and almost mischievous. The worries of life and the deeper parts of your feelings are ignored as you effortlessly flit over the surface of any troubles. Whilst this is essentially a beautiful symbol of joy, harmony, and a lightness of being, there may be an element of feeling cut off from your body or reality. This can lead to a sense of alienation or difficulty in knowing where to land or evading problems by ignoring them or rising above them. Effervescent spirits, dancing in a carefree manner, water and fun, Peter Pan attitudes, celebrations of the natural world, waterfalls, mist, nymphs, fairies, subtle energies. Irresponsibility, the avoidance of real situations, not taking anything seriously, escapism, moving or flying around, perceptions of light, fear of dark places, naive. So that's interesting in terms of this robot. And, and what's interesting about it is <clears throat> we talked about the sun corrupting the operating system of this kind of like super robot, for lack of a better word. Um, and we talked about like seeing Spock like on catnip where he's like rolling around on the floor laughing and like this reminds me of that and it kind of amplifies that aspect of this story in an interesting way. In other words, it's just a what if. It's, it's kind of like the 36 dramatic situations, like I'm looking at ambition and it triggers a lot of possibilities. As I'm looking at this, like the image itself, a nature spirit dancing in the midst of a waterfall, I was like, I don't know what that means. Didn't really like grab me. But the explanation is great. Um, feeling emotionally light and almost mischievous. That's an interesting word. The worries of life and deeper parts of your feelings are ignored as you effortlessly flit over the sur surface of any troubles. It's almost like this, the sun has like gotten him high on crack or something. Like he's like this robot that's usually like, that's not logical, we shouldn't do that like really organized, efficient on top of things is all of a sudden like, I want to look at the little birdie and can we wrestle? You know, it's like just kind of deliberately like had a wire snipped by the new owner to make it more malleable. And yet it's also plays into, um, well, it talks about the element, it says, while this is essentially a beautiful symbol of joy, harmony, and a lightness of being, there may be an element of feeling cut off from your body or reality, which is interesting for a robot. Cut off from reality is one thing, cut off from your body is another, but it really is like a personality change. And yet it seems great, like you're happier, you don't care about logic anymore, you know, like Spock wants to play the guitar instead of, you know, do quantum calculations or something. Um, this can lead to a sense of alienation or difficulty in knowing where to land. See, that's the thing of like, I used to be super clear about ethics and how to navigate certain types of things. And now I'm like, it reminds me of the, what was it? Um, the, the, the killer robot movie from years ago, um, Robocop. And uh, at one point toward the end of the movie, the Robocop is trying to go down a set of stairs, but it can't do stairs the way, and it comes up to the, and it's like toes are like trying to like, it's trying to like, how do you do this? Like, it, and it fell down the stairs. But the idea of like trying to, Difficulty in knowing where to land, like, how do I navigate this terrain? It's foreign to me now that I feel more giddy or, like, the robot's going to think 
this has been a great upgrade in his system, but it really it's like snipped a wire and made him happier and looser, which is desirable from his point of view because he wants to be human. It's like data learning how to laugh. And yet it's also like, this is kind of scary. I feel out of sorts. I don't know what's real. Um, effervescent spirits, dancing in carefree manner, water and fun. Remember we kept talking about the beach and being a good surfer. Peter Pan attitudes. It's, it's interesting. It's like the sun could really have sort of gotten him high. You know what I mean? And it's, he's like, this is fun. I can surf. The girls like me. You know, it's like I ate a hot dog today. You know, it's like it's tempting. <clears throat> and it's not just tempting, it's gratifying. And it's also discombobulating, if that's the right word, like the la a lack of judgment. But it's liberating. I mean, that's it. And it, see how it fits in with the dilemma. Like, I can't let go of this because it's creating me. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. And I can't keep doing this because I don't trust it. I feel manipulated. Part of me is like screaming that this is all wrong. And the other part of me is like, let's smoke more crack. This is great. You know, so it's like, but I know that smoking the crack is bad, but I need... I'm starving for that human capacity. And then the negative aspect of it is irresponsi irresponsibility, avoidance of real situations, not taking anything seriously, escapism, naivete, So that was just like a fun venture, but it really suggested a highly specific way that the sun could corrupt the operating system. And it's a reward system. It's a, you know, it's experiencing some of the joys of being human in a way that's irresistible and yet also, and it's very much wish granting. Here's your wish, you're becoming a real boy, you know, and be careful, you know, it's, yeah, you get all your wishes, but things go wrong too in this type of story. But that was, that was an interesting what if. Did you type in a question? No. Nope. Okay. I just thought about it. You just And then just hit this button. And then it brings this up. Wow. But I was focused. You could see me focus for a minute. Right. Like, I'm the robot. I'm like, what? How do I deal with this? And like, what's this story about of this robot trying to figure out how to deal with this? And that just popped up. And I probably won't even think about this for another six months. Like, it's not part of my normal thing at all. Jeff, you said you had something you wanted to add? Well, yeah, I just wanted to, now that we've... Now that we have an actual, like tangible beginnings of a plot rather than a set of open-ended possibilities, I wanted to quickly revisit the 36 to see which ones are jumping out and grabbing me by the throat. Like disaster, revolt is very, very central. Daring enterprise, um, madness, rivalry of superior and inferior is really interesting because it's like this kind of this, it's this robot versus the sun. And who's the superior? Who has the upper hand? Which is very much a matter of perception because the sun could think he's way in charge and the robot could be working circles around him, like have, you know, connection to the whole factory and everything. But the sun could then trump that and be like, you know, like, who's, who's the superior in any given situation and or the perception of who's superior? 
the son can think he's superior when he's not and the vice versa with the robot. So it's, an, it's a very active element in this story and it goes hand in glove with conflict with a god, ambition, uh, madness, revolt. You can see how some of those kind of form a molecule that constitute the core of this story. So I just wanted to do a quick run through and see which ones are jumping right out at me. And it's interesting here, looking back at an automaton wants to steal or wants to stop the theft of, interesting, a medicine and a contagion, there's a death, the innocent will suffer, but it means giving up their dreams. See, now that has real traction because if he's gonna become human and he's actually exhibiting aspects of being a human now, like being giddy and having fun, you know, it's like the gods becoming mortal. He gets to experience some of what humans experience. So he doesn't want to give up on that dream. He's now got more of a dream to give up on. And wish granting is more active here. And treachery and glory. These are like these are solidifying. So what I would do now would be to take a look at the Enneagram, which is a personality profiling system that is a combination of ancient wisdom about human nature and cutting edge psychology. And what I'm looking at here is a this comes from a website called the Enneagram Institute.com. And Enneagram is E N N E A G R A M. And it basically says that there's nine different personality types. Um, and each of those types has their own preferences, fears, motivations, drives, subconscious attitudes, relationship to the world, and so on. <clears throat> and so in going through it, I would be looking at a brief description of all nine types and seeing if any of them jump out at us for the only three characters we actually have at this point, which is the automaton, the son, and the dead father. <clears throat> so type number one is the reformer, the rational, idealistic type, principled, purposeful, self-controlled, and perfectionistic. Basic fear of being corrupt, evil, or defective. And each of the nine types has healthy aspects, average aspects, and unhealthy aspects. So type one, the reformer, the rational, idealistic type, principled, purposeful, self-controlled, and perfectionistic, certainly seems like it could possibly be the robot. The thing about this is they have an extreme sense of justice, of right and wrong. And they really want to make the rights, the wrongs into rights. But as they get into the average and unhealthy aspects, they become rigid and... Um, well, let me just read a little bit from the healthy aspect of a type one. Conscientious with strong personal convictions, they have an intense sense of right and wrong, personal, religious, and moral values, wish to be rational, rational reasonable, self-disciplined, mature, and moderate. That sounds like Spock and could be this AI or whatever it is. In the average aspect, dissatisfied with reality, they become high-minded idealists, feeling that it is up to them to improve everything crusaders, advocates, critics, into causes and explaining to others how things ought to be. They can be moralizing, scolding, abrasive, and indignantly angry. And in the unhealthy aspects, they can be highly dogmatic, self-righteous, intolerant, and inflexible, begin dealing in absolutes. They alone know the truth. Everyone else is wrong. They're very severe in judgments. So I could also see the sun being this character. 
because the rigid dogmatic aspects can be like Hitler going, I know best and I am saving the world for everybody else. Even though he's crazy and completely wrong, from his point of view, he's doing an important job. <clears throat> and it also brings up the question of how does a robot exhibit unhealthy aspects? But we've talked about that with corrupting the operating system and even putting some kind of catnip in there or something to make this robot giddy where it was former, formerly you know, like data, like it doesn't get a joke or something like that. Type 2, the helper, the caring interpersonal type, generous, demonstrative, people-pleasing, and possessive. Basic fear of being unwanted, unworthy of being loved. The servant is one of those types. Impassion, empathic, compassionate, feeling for others, caring and concerned about their needs. I'm wondering if that could be the robot it's not jumping out at me a lot. I'm not sure if a robot would feel unworthy of being loved. <clears throat> but it's worth taking a look at for a minute. <clears throat> type 3, the achiever. The success-oriented pragmatic type. Adaptable, excelling, driven, and image conscious. Basic fear of being worthless. Basic desire to be valuable and worthwhile. That could be the sun. It totally could be yeah. the sun. Yeah. Um, and... The, the, the healthy type three is self-assured, energetic, competent, with high self-esteem. They believe in themselves and their own value, adaptable, desirable, charming, and gracious. And even if the son is unhealthy, he can exhibit these healthy attributes, even if it's just an act. But he can be charming, lovable, high-performing, fascinating. Um, in the average aspect, highly concerned with their performance, with doing their job well, constantly driving self to achieve goals as if self-worth depended on it, terrified of failure, compare self with others in search for status and success, uh, become careerists, social climbers, invested in exclusivity and being the best, become image conscious, highly, conceived with, highly concerned with how they are perceived, begin to package themselves according to the expectations of others and what they need to do to be successful. So threes really care about what they look like to others. And the more unhealthy they get, the more desperate acts they'll do to keep looking good. So in the unhealthy, fearing failure and humiliation, they can be exploitative and opportunistic, covetous of the success of others, and willing to do whatever it takes to preserve the illusion of their superiority. Devious and deceptive, so their mistakes and wrongdoings will not be exposed. Untrustworthy, maliciously betraying or sabotaging people to triumph over them. So that's an interesting, um, strong possibility for the sun. And they say that the basic fear really drives each of these nine types. And here, the basic fear for a type three is of being worthless. So really wants to feel valuable and worthwhile and is kind of irrationally desperate to overcome that subconscious belief that he is worthless. And it could be a she. It doesn't have to be a male. The, everything's fluid at this point. Type four, the individual is the sensitive withdrawn type, expressive, dramatic, self-absorbed and temperamental. Basic fear that they have no identity or personal significance. Basic desire to find themselves and their significance. So the healthy one is self-aware, introspective, on the search for self-aware of feelings and impulses, sensitive and intuitive. Average, take an artistic romantic orientation to life, creating beautiful aesthetic environments, heightened reality through fantasy. And they want to sort out their emotions before they move, tackle anything else. Unhealthy, when dreams fail, become self-inhibiting and angry at self, depressed and alienated from self and others. I'm not sure if that feels like any of these three. Type 5, the investigator, the intense cerebral type, perceptive, innovative, secretive, and isolated. Basic fear of being useless, helpless, or incapable. The basic desire to be capable and competent. And one of the, one of the types is the problem solver. And there's also the iconoclast. 
And it's possible that both the father and the um, automaton could share this type, but be slightly different. Like the father could be an iconoclast, one who really wants to shake things up and change things. And the automaton may be more of a problem solver, but maybe becomes an iconoclast, becomes revolutionary. Um, the healthy aspect of a five is to observe everything with extraordinary perceptiveness and insight. Most mentally alert, curious, searching intelligence. Nothing escapes their notice, foresight and prediction. Able to concentrate, become engrossed in what has caught their attention. Attain skillful mastery in whatever excites them, excited by knowledge. Often become expert in some field, innovative and inventive producing extremely valuable original works, highly independent, idiosyncratic, and whimsical. At their best, they become visionaries, broadly comprehending the world while penetrating it profoundly. So this is someone who sees things sort of differently from other people, is intensely smart, trying to get to the bottom of things, connecting things in unusual ways that most people don't, and can come up with innovative solutions. In the average aspect can begin conceptualizing and fine-tuning everything before acting, working things out in their mind, model building, getting ready forever and never leaping into action is their worst trait. So in the unhealthy become reclusive and isolated from reality, eccentric and nihilistic, highly unstable and fearful of aggressions, reject and repulse. I could see the father kind of going downhill at the end and sort of naturally being secretive, especially with a big organization and industrial espionage and maybe got shafted by one of his top people and now doesn't trust anybody, then leans more on the robot and starts to reprogram the robot to be more like the one person I can trust. But then the father gets killed and the son starts to reprogram. So it's interesting possibilities. Type six, the loyalist, the committed security oriented type engaging, responsible, anxious, and suspicious. The basic fear of being with, without support or guidance. The basic desire to have security and support. Now that's possibly interesting for the robot because the basic fear of being without support or guidance, that, we were talking early on about the possibility that if he is able to conjure the father back to life for a bit, that the father may say to him, you don't need me to tell you what to do. You can think, you, you know, form your own conclusions, take action. You know, that's what real people do. You want to be a person, that's the most important thing. Now, I don't know if that makes for a weak robot if it's always, um, dependent on other people telling it what to do. It makes it feel less sophisticated. But that might be something that the son imbues the robot with more deeply by corrupting the operating system to make it more dependent and more showing up for orders rather than just knowing what to do. And feeling more like obeying orders is a critical part of his correct function. Um, so it's conceivable. <clears throat> um, so in the healthy aspect, a type six, the loyalist is uh, able to elicit strong emotional responses from others, very appealing, endearing, lovable, and affectionate. Now that's an interesting flavor for an AI where it really is likable and it's like, hey, how you doing? Instead of greetings, you know, it's, it could be programmed to be friendly. Trust is important, bonding with others, forming permanent relationships and alliances, dedicated to individual and, uh, individuals and movements in which they deeply believe. Um, in the average aspect, start investing their time and energy into whatever they believe will be safe and stable. Organizing and structuring, they look to alliances and authorities for security and continuity, constantly vigilant, anticipating problems. In the unhealthy aspect, 
Fearing they have ruined their security, they become panicky, volatile, self-disparaging with acute inferiority feelings. Seeing themselves as defenseless, they seek out a stronger authority to, or belief to resolve all their problems. And that's interesting because in terms of potential crisis, if the sun has been corrupting the operating system, then this thing which would normally be as confident as Spock or Data, like that's a ridiculous idea, here's the logical thing to do, and not going, I'm not sure if that's right, like having no uncertainty at all, the crisis could also consist in madness of a sort where this formerly supremely confident AI now has a lot of like self-doubt because, and, and it's been programmed to seek advice, seek orders. So right at the point when this automaton needs its own excellent judgment at the most critical point in this story, it's faltering. And one of the key, I think they nailed it in the book, uh, The Wisdom of the Enneagram, which has a 40 page chapter on each type instead of just a one sheet. It says the single most fundamental weakness of a six is lack of trust in their own judgment. They just lack of confidence. They're always looking to others, tell me what to do. And so, which is what the sun wants to do to this robot, it wants it to be malleable. And so this critical failure in confidence and autonomy and decision-making at the most critical moment, the most critical juncture in the story is a great way to complicate the crisis because it's not just things are happening externally which are disastrous and I got to leap into action, but at this point I trust my own, as the robot, I trust my own decision-making the least ever. And I'm kind of incapable of making a decision and taking an action at this critical juncture, which is also makes that decision and action to stand up even more dynamic cause this robot is taking a leap of faith or just an, 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 you know, it's one analogy that I use for decision and action in the face of crisis is that the crisis demands immediate decision and action. You no longer have the luxury of the luxury of contemplating your dilemma from a distance. What am I going to do when I have to choose? So the crisis is akin to like you're really busy with something in the house and all caught up in it and you look out the window and see your kid about to get hit by a truck on the street. You're not going, well, I'm in the middle of this recipe. It's like, no, you're like throwing the stool right through the kitchen window and getting cut to crap to get to the street before your kid gets flattened. Like there's the decision is like instant. And it's like who you really are is right there. And that's the nature of decision and action in the face of crisis. It demands an immediate decision and action. So for this robot to leap into action, even if that's explosively contrary to some of the deepest current commands, shows what this robot's really made of what the true personality of this, what the true character of this thing is. And that's what Aristotle said, decision and action in the face of crisis reveal the true character of the protagonist. And it, it can bring out the best in people and it can also bring out the worst in people. So the person who jumps up and runs out screaming or, you know, somebody doesn't move when they saw your kid, you know, about to get hit, they're like, hey, uh, you should look out here. Like, why weren't you out the door before you even told me? You know, it's like, I thought I knew you. Like, that's crazy. You watched for three seconds. 
you know, frozen and I went through the frickin' window while you stood there doing nothing, people react differently in emergencies and it strips the mask off. And that's fascinating to the audience because in reality, we don't often see naked human emotional reality. It's so masked and covered and camouflaged and self-deception and rationalizations and all this stuff that helps us navigate the world and feel comfortable. But when you strip all that away and like, what are you gonna do right now? Some people will run and some people will leap into action. And they don't, they themselves didn't know they were gonna run away or leap into action. You see the people that, you know, rescued 10 people out of a burning house are like, I was more surprised than anybody when I ran in there. I didn't think I would ever do that. But I just, my legs were running toward the house when I heard them screaming. <clears throat> So the loyalist, the type six is interested, the committed security oriented type, engaging, responsible, anxious, and suspicious. It's, it's interesting. Type seven, the enthusiast, the busy fun loving type, spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive, and scattered. Basic fear of being deprived and in pain, basic desire to be satisfied and content. They're highly responsive, excitable, enthusiastic about sensation and experience, most extroverted type. In the average aspect, as restlessness increases, they wanna have more options and choices available to them, less focused, constantly seeking out new things. In the unhealthy aspect, desperate to quell their anxieties can be impulsive and infantile, don't know when to stop. So I'm not sure if that fits anybody, except it might fit the robot as he's in that kind of giddy phase always wanting the next distraction, but I'm not sure. Type eight, the challenger, the powerful dominating type, self-confident, decisive, willful, and confrontational. Basic fear of being harmed or controlled by others, basic desire to protect themselves, to be in control of their own life and destiny. And this could easily be the sun. Self-confident, self-assertive, self self-confident and strong, learn to stand up for what they need and want, resourceful can-do attitude and passionate inner drive, decisive and authoritative. In the average aspect, self-sufficiency, financial independence, and having enough resources are important concerns. Becoming enterprise, pragmatic, rugged individualists, wheeler dealers, risk-taking, hardworking, denying own emotional needs. In the unhealthy aspect, defying any attempt to control them, become com completely ruthless, dictatorial, might makes right, the criminal and outlaw, renegade and con artist. So that could certainly be the sun. Um, type three is interesting for the sun and type eight. Then there's type nine, the peacemaker, the easygoing self-effacing type, receptive, reassuring, agreeable, and complacent. Doesn't really feel like any of the characters in this story at first glance. So the robot could be a type five or a type six. And the sun is definitely a three or an eight. What do you think? It could be a three or an eight. It really... I mean, that's the nature of this game is that you, it, what it did is it gave us several strong possibilities, two strong possibilities for both the protagonist and the antagonist. And we don't need to go, oh, it's that, because what we want to do is navigate through the story more and keep in mind that a type three is high achieving, but desperate to look good no matter what. A type eight is powerful, dominating, can make things happen, can be a great leader. A healthy eight is magnanimous, generous, insightful, giving others credit. An unhealthy eight is desperate to maintain control and crush all opposition. So they're slightly different and one may prove more useful as the story develops more. And we may not get to that point in the development of this story, but that's the process, that we're tentatively holding both of them as possibilities and seeing which one fits the demands of the story, or if the Enneagram type suggests possibilities for the story, then we may end up going with that one because the Enneagram offers a lot of specific traits for a character 
And it's useful, like once you have a dilemma tentatively roughed out for the protagonist, which is what we have now, then it's interesting to look at, okay, so for that type of dilemma, like I can't let go of this chance to become a human and it's like an irrational, it's not just, I wish I was a human, but it's like, I've got to become human. I'm desperate to get that. And I can't sacrifice people to get there, but I can't let go of that chance. So that particular dilemma, you know, how does that go with a type five, where the basic fear is of being useless, helpless, or incapable? And they're brilliant and they're always questioning things and trying to get to the bottom of things, but they, they're all constantly model building and fine tuning before they take action. And they can be reclusive and isolated from reality and get obsessed with dark imagery and so on. So is that type of dilemma, does a type five, see, different personality types will interact with a dilemma in different ways. Like, if you're a type three and you're really concerned with how you appear to other people, then certain dilemmas will freak you out more than someone who's naturally relaxed and can sweep problems under the carpet, like a type nine, but they're, they're relaxed and comfortable, or a type eight who has to be in control all the time. So once you get a dilemma up and running, then it's useful to go through the different Enneagram types and see how would this type deal with that particular dilemma. And so, looking at type six with that dilemma, to be with the basic fear, to be without support or guidance, trusting others. The, the, one of the things about a six is they're, they're always hoping that the next person they link up with will be able to show them how to really navigate life properly. They attach on to people and go, are you the one that's gonna show me how to really do my life right? So they're always, they, because they don't trust their own judgment. So they're like, you gotta tell me, because I can't do it. So with that type of personality, react to this dilemma more than a type five. And, you know, the fact that a type six is the, the, the average to unhealthy type, the healthy type six doesn't have that problem. The average to unhealthy type six really doesn't trust its own inner judgment because they're very mental. They're, they're the top of the thought triad. There's thought, feeling, and I don't remember what the third one is. Um, but the type six is the most, is the highest of the thought triad in the nine. So they're all mental activity, which in the average to unhealthy aspects means they're out of touch with their own inner guidance, their heart and their gut, because they're always got to think about it, but they can't feel their way through it, which makes them, and they know that they're not good decision makers because they're not in touch with their intuition and their internal guidance system. They're cut off from it. So if the son is saying, I've made some modifications in you that get you closer to being a human, then that type six is like, this is what I need. Especially if the operating system has been crippled in some ways so that it's less capable of making strong fundamental decisions at key points and is more reliant on the sun. And the sun is creating great reward system. And the average type six can become evasive, indecisive, cautious, procrastinating, and ambivalent. And that's kind of like where the sun needs him to be as the son is trying to manipulate him into helping sort of go against his own moral code or against his own inner programming or 
the way he's been programmed. So that's interesting. And I would leave that. We don't need to solve that at this point. That's something that you leave those possibilities floating as the story gets developed further. And one of them will probably like, oh, this one is deaf. I can see more and more that it's this one. Or it may be like we were wrong on both of them. It's really this. But you just have a, 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 a flexibility. A, a t it's a tentative answer. And the other thing is that people in general are often uncomfortable with partial solutions. You know, like, like we're in now where it's like, I'm not really sure, but I'm very used to making tentative decisions and floating them both as possibilities as we move forward, just kind of going, oh, it could be this or this, and time will tell as we explore more. But people who are like, ah, I don't want to be halfway through to an answer. I don't like that. So then they jump to conclusions and go, okay, it's got to be that. And they've cut off, they, they say experts in creativity know that there's often 10 right answers to a problem. The people that don't know that, when they find one of the 10 right answers, they go, oh, that's it. But then they stop questioning and they stop looking and they're missing on a, the whole spectrum of what is the right answer. And that's what jumping to conclusions is too. You can even be wildly wrong, but you're like, I don't care if I'm wrong. I can't, I'm desperate to not be partially formed. I can't be halfway through, halfway to a solution. Jeff, we've gotten to the tail end of our work with the story engine cards and the story that you've developed. How can we take it to the finish line? I know we weren't exactly sure certain details, but we've fleshed out a lot of interesting options here. Right. To, to follow this, um, this trajectory, which is basically we're working with several of the seven tools that I teach including the 36 dramatic situations and the Enneagram, but the main one we're focusing on here is dilemma, which consists of dilemma, crisis, decision and action, and resolution. So we've really solidified a dilemma to the degree that we can. We have some good, strong possibilities for Enneagram types, which will inform the story more as it, the story progresses. The thing that I would do now is focus on crisis, which is the dilemma come to a head, come to a make or break point, decision and action in the face of crisis, and then the resolution of the dilemma. And once we have that, then we've completed one pass through one aspect of creating this story by focusing mostly on dilemma, which is the way I start any story. I kind of grab the story and look at it through the lens of dilemma because the protagonist caught in a good strong dilemma amplifies the dramatic power of the story. It really helps imbue the story with dramatic intensity right from the beginning of creating it so that you're building drama into the story from the beginning of the process rather than inventing a story and then trying to retrofit dramatic tension into it. <clears throat> so it's sort of dyed in the wool. Uh, so the next step would be to focus on the way in which this dilemma comes to a critical juncture around the end of Act 2. <clears throat> and because we've only got a tentative but pretty solid statement of dilemma. We've got a sense of personality types. The thing to do would be to focus on dilemma and we don't have to, like we're not going to solve it comprehensively because the dilemma is still tentative and fluid. Uh, but we want to bring crisis up to the level that we have the dilemma at this point. So 
in this type of story, what we're saying is that So if I'm this robot, which is one of the ways I deal with dilemma as I put myself in the position of the protagonist, and like it's unacceptable to do these morally reprehensible things that the sun is pushing me to participate in. It's, it's kind of like the sun needs me to actuate it. Otherwise, he'd just go do it himself. Why would I be in the middle of the mix? Probably because I'm wired into the whole factory and that kind of thing. So he, he needs me to execute or to help execute. Probably because I can do so many functions at once. He could do five of them. I can do 40 billion in a second. It might take him all day to do five of them. So I'm required. So it's unacceptable to participate in this morally reprehensible thing that my ethics programming kind of forbids me from doing. And yet, and yet as a loyalist, as a type six potentially, a loyalist isn't all about giving loyalty to someone else. They're also looking for loyalty, but the type six is one of the most basic things about a type six is that they're contradictory. They can be both selfless and selfish. They can be, you know, generous and stingy. They can be active and passive. There's all these different opposites that they can embody in one person. So if I'm this like sentient robot of some kind, not necessarily sentient, but a high level AI, I can't participate in these morally reprehensible things. And yet, um, I can't let go of what the sun is offering me, which is a chance to be human. And I also have a need to like be loyal um, type sixes can be like blindly loyal. They're always questioning, but once they get beyond their questioning and they really become loyal to something, they're also the type that can go down with the ship. They have trouble, even if they see they're wrong, they're like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in anyway. So I can't contribute to the morally reprehensible stuff, but I can't let go of this opportunity to become human and I'm like sort of naturally wired to defend the organization that I'm part of and I'm starving to be human. So, and there's this thing being put in motion where this company, not just a company, this massive corporation that's probably similar to the Tyrell Corporation potentially in certain ways, somewhere around the end of act two, it's about to be launched. And the, this robot has to, well, the robot is still wrestling with the dilemma, really enjoying the perks of kind of giddy humanness, going to the beach, like doing stuff he never did before. And that presumes there's like a humanoid type body, but that it could still be a robot, but could go surfing, girls are interested, can eat a hot dog, can get sunburned, but it's still a robot, but it's more, it's like Spock on catnip or whatever. Um, and if the operating system is being corrupted, then at the point of crisis, the inner facilities of this automaton are compromised to a dangerous level so that right when this automaton needs his faculties the most, and it could totally be a she, all of the, any of these, it could all be women, it could all be anything. 
all of the, the faculties that are needed most are the ones that are most missing at this crucial juncture. And <clears throat> see, one of the things about a crisis is that it's often the worst possible things happening at the worst possible moment. <clears throat> and one of the aspects of the worst possible things happening at the worst possible moment can be that you're right on the very precipice of total success. Like, why is everything falling apart? I'm, I'm, I'm an inch away from, I'm doing it. It's working, I'm pulling it off and it's all going to hell right on the edge of success. That can be a crisis. So the emerging humanoid aspects in the personality of this automaton, it can be like, it just got a girlfriend. Like, it's like, it's like, and it's going on a certain, you know, it's like, like, why now? Like, I'm, they really think I'm human and I feel like I'm human and it's working and she likes me and I'm a good surfer and I, you know, it's like, it's way worse to give that up now than it was 20 minutes earlier in the plot. Cause I'm like, I'm addicted to being a person and it's working or it's right on the edge of working. Um, you know, it might be that the sun has to, I got to adjust you a little bit more and then you won't even remember you were, used to be a robot. You'll really think you're this person and all that type of stuff. And he's like, yes, yes, I got to have that. And right at that point is when things come to a head. Okay, we're launching tonight. Something happened, we're moving the launch date up. So right now, and we were also talking about how if the, automaton in seeking guidance because the giddiness of being human is really intoxicating and like addicting, but the kind of smoke alarm that's going off in the brain of this automaton, like you're gonna kill a billion people, like wake up, what is going on? Like this is wrong. Like that's screaming in there too. And and that's like the dilemma that this character has been wrestling with throughout act two. And as part of that, if he's reanimated the father who created this whole company and the father is like able to give him words of wisdom and encouragement, then that can be helping him. And um, it's possible that at the point of crisis, I first thought that the sun could kind of pull the plug on this reanimation, even if it's just an AI that he's brought to a level of fruition that he can um, communicate with it. Um, so have an intelligent, so like he's upgraded the AI aspects of the deceased father so that it emulates his personality enough that he can have like a real conversation with who that person really was for him and like you can really, you, you can make a decision and you're not weak and you're a good person. You know, it's saying all these things. At first I thought the son might come along and kill the father again if he's the one that killed the father earlier on. But it could even be worse than that. Like what if the son hears him getting words of wisdom from the father and the son starts laughing and like, you fell for all that crap. And he like hits a button so that like the real father comes out and the real father could be a treacherous malignant monster just like the son. And that's like who he really is. It's just the disguise has come off so that for this poor robot who's desperately struggling to navigate the demands of his ethics, his moral compass and his incredible hunger to be human and to be loyal. And at that point, he finds out that the founding father really was a like sadistically vicious, horrible creature. And that's why the son turned out that way, even though he's great at, hey, he's like everybody's best friend. 
but he's like this treacherous monster. For that to hit this automaton right at the worst possible moment, then you not only have the kind of mental breakdown going on inside the robot as the faculties that he needs the most at this moment are being corroded by the sun as the operating system is corrupted more and more, but that the one person who is a shining light and a source of belief and faith and everything is revealed to be by far the worst monster in this entire universe. It's such a crushing shock. It's like a backbreaking, taking away the one hope he had at the worst possible moment and taking it away in the worst possible way. Like, you know, the father ends up laughing at him like you fell for all this shit. You're such a loser. You don't know anything, you know, and we made you like that. You're a manipulable little tin robot that does what we tell you and is very happy about it, loves everybody. You know, it's like, you know, and like you're trash. You're, you served your function. Thank you. Like, get out, which is um, the kinsman slain unrecognized. Um, and discovery of the dishonor of a loved one and disaster and madness. All of those things are constituting, those are some of the situations that are very active at the point of crisis. And so it's like, you know, the rug isn't just jerked out from under this robot at this key point, but there's not even a floor anymore. He's like in free fall. But he's got to make a decision about this world crisis that's in the throes of, it's happening now. And maybe part of him is actuating it now, like performing the computations like he's been ordered because he is just a robot or a puppet. And yet part of him is like screaming to try and stop it. And so the decision and action is going to be something like this robot makes a key decision that he's going to try to stop this and takes an action. A, just a decision is nothing. That's just like, okay, I'll do that. But you could still be laying in bed saying that. It's getting up and taking action. So it's decision and action in the face of crisis. And the decision and action are two sides of the same coin. It's one thing. Like you see your kid about to get hit by a truck. You're not going, hmm, I better. It's like you're already through the window before you even have a chance to think about it. You know, like you're throwing the frying pan and the, the stool right through the window and you're getting cut to shit and flying out there to rescue your kid. It's a decision and action in the face of crisis. So for this robot to take some kind of stand to try to stop this thing which is already in progress and looks like it's going to win. And the robot may not be able to stop its own processes, but it's going to try to throw a monkey wrench in there. In fact, the action would be to throw a monkey wrench in there, which may or may not win. But is no longer paralyzed, like, what am I going to do when, when I have to make a choice? Now, I've made a choice and I'm going to war. And it's the opening salvo in the fight to the finish. Um, and it's an attempt, generally, the beginning of the fight to the finish is an honest attempt at a killing blow. Like, it's not like I'm going to punch you and then we're going to punch a whole bunch more. Like, I'm going to hit you so hard that you die on impact. That's the intent of the beginning of the fight to the finish by the protagonist. A very strong action that could win, but you have a very powerful antagonist, so you're evenly matched. So from there on out, it's really a fight to the finish between the son and possibly the AI of the father and this robot over the fate of the world. Uh, and. If the robot conclusively resolves his dilemma, which is the resolution in the end, and 
is kind of a desperate attempt at sabotage to try to stop them, then the robot probably has to grow a lot to be able to conclusively resolve that dilemma. This is like a desperate action and an emergency, and this is more like a comprehensive, massive victory that isn't going to backslide. If he beats them, they're done. They're gone. They might be both dead or they might be killed by the virus that they were going to. But whatever it is, he's really won. And he might still be a surfer on the beach at the end. You never know. But um, so there's going to have to be, you know, it's the character, it's the completion of the character arc um, and a real fight to the finish. And because the antagonist is extremely powerful, then it's not a walk in the park at all to get from the point of decision and action to the point of resolution. This is a declaration of war and it could easily be a catastrophic loss for the automaton. But the automaton is growing, changing, and maybe even still feeding on the original words of the founding father when the AI said, you can do it. You're, you're a good creature. You're stronger than you know. Have trust in yourself. Those might still be guiding words that help the robot grow enough to defeat their treachery and their power. Because even if the robot has a great victory five minutes after the decision and action in the face of crisis, the son and possibly the AI or the father may you know, outweigh that with a really treacherous, powerful act. And like now our automaton is seriously getting his butt kicked. And like it's, you know, it's the back and forth as the automaton grows in capability, confidence, and even sense of humanity, like a real conscience, a real ability to see that that's wrong. And I don't need my computer to be going, this is 72% this way, this is 19. It's like, no, that's fucking wrong. And there's no like, it's just clear so that the resolution, if the automaton wins in the end, the, this automaton is using some of the strengths of the villain and of the corporation and probably humans that work in there that he has turned into allies, like, you know, like you and who's army. It needs to be like wickedly smart, incredibly forceful, no half measures, and, you know, crushing truly treacherous lunatics who will stop at nothing and who are immensely powerful. So this, the weak little automaton that was like disabled by the sun and wondering about things when it never used to, is now going to be, um, by the end, a massively powerful warrior who's self-confident, can make decisions, has a good strong sense of ethics, but will also burn this whole factory down. And if a couple hundred workers die in that, it's going to save billions and prevent this great evil from coming out. So capable of making hard choices, great strength of character, insight, learned deviousness, learns how to fight dirty, all of that, whatever it takes to conclusively resolve the dilemma that was paralyzing him earlier on, so that he's a completely different character at the end than he was, you know, for a big chunk of his dilemma. <clears throat> Then you have a powerful dynamic ending. You know, and it's possible he even converts the virus that was going to kill a billion people into, I don't know, a vaccine that, you know, ends, you know, something on the earth. 
so that because it was already too late to stop the distribution of it, but he can affect the chemistry of it as it's being distributed so that it's actually ultra healthy for the people that take it rather than they're going to die in 19 hours or something like that. Um, or it could, you know, it could be a permanent cure for smallpox or you know, some of those things are already cured, but it could be something like that. Um, and, you know, maybe the assistant of the sun, maybe when the sun said, look, when I do this last step to you, you really will be a human. Maybe the assistant of the sun is able to do that step to him so that we, we see him on the beach and he, he'd still be this person of great power. I don't think you want to lose that. But, you know, it would be like, you know, seeing some really smart, powerful person on the beach just hanging out, having fun. Um, so that you could see how that could be one powerful resolution to this story and a conclusive defeat of the sun and the father's AI and a prevention of this great catastrophe and the destruction of this power grab. And <clears throat> once you can isolate and articulate the resolution, which we've only partially articulated at this point, it's pretty tentative and flexible and fluid, but um, we can see it and you can see what it is. So that enables you to see the theme of the story. And the, um, the best way to isolate and articulate theme is to look at the resolution and to look at the way in which the protagonist resolves the dilemma. So it's not what happens, but the way in which the protagonist does it. Because there you have the completion of the transformation of this character. And so this person who used to not trust their own decision-making process and need guidance from others and be unsure and suspicious is now like, I know what to do. And I'm, you know, unilaterally making all these decisions and I'm using my power. And it's just like he might even be hearing the father's voice, you know, the the untrue voice of the father, but it's still true for him. You are a good creature. Use your power. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. You don't need me to tell you what to do. So that he's like, you know, he's like coming into power. And if you look at the way in which he resolves the dilemma, you see that tremendous growth of power and confidence and capability. And that's what the story is about thematically. You can, you can look right there, there's the theme. And the thing about working with theme in this way is that you will have like a heart or gut level understanding of it, like you get it, even if you can't articulate it right away. Um, and that's, that's a really great, place to be because you really comprehend the theme and the words you don't necessarily have the words to be able to articulate it clearly yet but that's okay because look at what the audience when the audience sees that movie and they walk out of the theater and they feel that greatness of heart that this character imbued in them that they're taking the theme home with them they've got it they feel that greatness of heart and that's what the, the writer created that, crafted that. The final effect is the principal effect. The ending is where the power of the whole film comes together. Um, it's like cracking a whip. The tail end of it breaks the speed of sound, and that's what the sound is. And it's like being on a, you know, a, a chain with, with skaters, and everybody's holding hands, and the last person gets whipped way out ahead. The, the power of the whole story is wrapped up and delivered through the ending. So you're sculpting the mood that the audience goes home in. And they take the theme home with them. And if you do it powerfully enough, you change their lives. They never look at the world the same after that. That greatness of heart that they got from this story, they, they can always go back to that. And it's very powerful. 
And like, I remember when I saw Braveheart and I felt like that at the end, even though it was a, a weird, sad ending, I felt that greatness of heart of Wallace. And I'm actually reading Andrew Carnegie's autobiography now, and he's Scottish and grew up in Scotland. And he said, they grew up on Wallace. Wallace, Robert the Bruce, who became king later, and one other guy. And they said, for a Scottish kid, he was our hero. And we were like, Wallace wouldn't have stood down now. Like we, like they become indomitable. And it like impacted their life for, for the rest of his life. He was always like Wallace, Bruce, and whoever the other guy was, I can't remember. But like you, you can really like shape somebody's approach to life. Like I still remember when I saw the end of Blade Runner. It impacted me and it still does. And great movies with great endings can really like permanently change how an audience thinks. And that's, and they do that to varying degrees all the way from zero to 100%. Like 100% is like you never look at the world in the way you used to again. And, and then of course, you know, a lot of it is just like you feel amazing for a couple days or you feel beat up because it was a rough ending, but you learn something from it. But it's, it's, you know, the ambition of a writer is to permanently change how people think. And you just look at the resolution and look at the way in which the protagonist resolves the dilemma. That's the theme. Look at Training Day. The way in which Jake resolves his dilemma is to absolutely stand for his principles. Antoine Fuqua, the director, and David Ayers, the writer, both said Training Day is about what if one man says no? And it's Jake's absolute ferocity. I will not stop. I will not go away. You're not getting away with this, no matter what. That's what that movie's about thematically. You can feel that coming out of the theater. That's in you. <clears throat> so that's, that's like a quick run through, really, dilemma, crisis, decision, and action, and resolution. But because different Enneagram types will react to a dilemma in different ways, that helps a lot. And you can see how the 36 dramatic situations just, it was like throwing gasoline on a fire. Like I could see some elements and you throw ambition and madness and conflict with the God and rivalry of superior and inferior and the necessity of sacrificing loved ones. And, uh, you know, all those types of things gave us ideas to create the story. It's just a set of, it's a brainstorming tool. It's suggestive possibilities. It triggers possibilities. Um, and there's obviously a whole bunch more tools. I have seven tools all together, but this is a good look at, the main thing I'm doing here is as I start with a raw idea, I go right to dilemma. And it's almost like, it's almost like the image of like, you might see like somebody in Africa carving a drum and they're like working on the drum, but they're with their feet, they're holding the bottom of this thing that's gonna become a drum and they clamp it in. And like I'm clamping on to dilemma as I wrestle with the story. So it's all about the protagonist's dilemma as I invent the story. I'm focused on dilemma as I build the story. And that's a really fundamental skill in using this tool. And that dilemma is two equally unacceptable alternatives, two equally painful choices. And it really does that Robbie the robot, like the person is paralyzed between these two equally unacceptable alternatives for the whole second act, the paralysis is broken at the point of crisis, but it's not until another 10 or 15 minutes of movie at the resolution of the dilemma that the dilemma is conclusively, conclusively resolved. And so it constitutes three quarters or more of the story and occupies the full proportion of the story. It's not a little thing. It's not a, a minor problem that crops up. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real process that is extremely helpful in essentially turning story into drama. Because if it's just story, then it's mere information and it's not always as gripping as it could be. And a good strong dilemma can turn a good story into a great drama 
in any genre. Like you look at like Liar Liar with uh, Jim Carrey, it's a fun whacked out comedy, but it has a dilemma of magnitude. There's substance to it. Tootsie is a fun comedy, but there's a lot of substance and depth and a good strong dilemma. So it, it can work in any genre. And obviously if it's a completely whacked out comedy, then there'll be less magnitude and more fun. So it's obviously, you have a sense of how much of it you need for a particular type of story. Um, but you know, the more familiar with it, the more, and the more you understand the underlying principles behind what makes the tool work, then you can adjust the tool as needed for each specific type of script that has different demands and different tone and different intensity and different impact on the audience. Jeff, you've provided such valuable information today and I love the way you, you question different story points. If someone wants to work with you, what's the best way they can find your teachings, uh, you know, become a student of yours? Well, um, I have a couple different things. I have a book, Writing a Great Movie, which will walk you through all this and I build a real script in the second half. I have a three month pre-recorded training program where we build a real script in three months and it's, you work along with me helping build the script and solving the different puzzles involved as we build it. That's 65 hours of pre-recorded video. And then I have a two year live training program where we work five days a week, about two and a half hours a day. And that three months is the first part of that. So you can get live intensive training for two years. And then uh, we have a subscription service where you can sign up and pay a certain amount each month and have ongoing access to live classes every week, pre-recorded trainings, uh, writings, and so on, that kind of thing. We can have a link below as well for yes. our viewers to click on. So if I want to take a class, can I just choose which one? Or do I, is there a prerequisite before uh, taking some? You can choose which one, but for the two year, the first part of that is the three month pre-recorded. That's called course one because course two is continuously ongoing. So like there's someone who just finished course one yesterday who will be joining course two and we're halfway through writing a romantic comedy. So he, and because he's built a whole thriller with me in course one, he's conversing with the tools, wrote the script based on the outline that we created together. So he can jump right in and he has to learn about this particular story, but he's fluent enough with the tools that he can just jump right in and not be going, wait, what are you guys talking about? He's like, yeah, I know how to, I know my way around. And so it's, it's, um, it's designed so that course one sets you up to jump right into course two at any time. And then I do private consulting as well, which anybody can get hold of me at script.kitchen, just jeff at script.kitchen. There's no dot com, it's dot kitchen, script.kitchen. Are most of your students working adults uh, taking this in addition to their 40 some hour are, Some job? are retired. Mm -hmm. They have more time, um, but it's, it's, it's all across the board and one of them is 15 living in Romania. They're like all over the world and all different stages. You know, it's, it's a commitment of time and I'm not working with any of my individual students' own screenplays because that's too complicated. But we're all working together to build a script and they're getting extensive hands-on experience using all the tools in a collaborative way. And then once, they're, once they've been in course two for long enough to feel like they really have a handle on the tools, then they build their own script in front of the group to make sure that they can really do this stuff themselves. And we come by every few days to check in on how they're doing and they might want us to brainstorm with them or you know, they might want to do it themselves. I'd be like looking at what they're doing. What did you just solve? Having them articulate their thought process, um, correcting them if they're doing something technically slightly wrong. Um, just to make sure that they really can do this on their own. 
and that then, you know, they'll be extremely skilled, seasoned, and versatile as dramatists. And you could throw them a comedy, a horror story, a sports drama, anything, and they're like, they know how to grapple with it, make it work dramatically, think through the deep aspects of the story, dimensionalize it, build the characters, make it fresh and different and not predictable and cliche. You know, I'm teaching some very powerful tools and rigorous technique, but I'm always emphasizing you got to have a real sense of adventure. You know, it's storytelling. And the more craft you have, the less you have to make safe choices. People make safe choices as writers because they don't have the technique to make a complex choice and make that work. So they make a safe choice because they know they can make that work. But I really teach reckless abandon, like explosive creativity and like drive off the get yourself in trouble. If you're not in over your head, you're not doing your job right. People don't want to see the same lukewarm story trotted out again. They want to see something where they're going, what was that? And like, what just happened and where is it going now? You know, it's that's the fun of being a writer and you know, so, and the other thing is that there's these seven tools, but fully half of what I'm teaching is just pure seat of the pants storytelling. You're just making stuff up. And that's huge. The tools are just a part of that. And they can shape some of your processes and make the things you choose work better and more dramatic and more compelling and good tight cause and effect so it moves well without being bogged down by unnecessary stuff. But if your story is bland and predictable, then you could just end up with well-structured crap. So mere technique is not enough. You really need explosive creativity and reckless abandon and just the refusal to make safe choices and the refusal to knuckle under a cliche and all that type of stuff. So it's part wild animal and it's part like domesticated animal where you really can make concise, rigorous choices and technique. But the thing that you're applying that to is, you know, like a 30 foot gorilla that'll rip your arms off in a second. You're working hard to make the tools go to that. The story is the master. You're just the person who's trying to make it work dramatically so it can be stage worthy on TV, on film and theater.